Hello and welcome back to this Dumb but Idealistic Crusade. I am the Motion Picture Analyst and today, continuing in my James Bond commentary series, we will be discussing and talking about the 1967 Charles K. Feldman spoof film of Casino Royale, which is really the lone outlier of the James Bond film series and one that uh, continues to perplex and confuse and completely bewilder audiences coming into it because still to this day most people come in thinking that uh, if it's not just a James Bond film uh, it is a direct straight parody of a James Bond film and usually most people go into it without having any knowledge of the absolute insanity that uh, was the production of this film which turned into one of the most notorious runaway film productions in the entire history of the medium. It's an absolutely fascinating film to study even if you don't like it. Uh, and I know a great many people absolutely despise this film, which has always actually kind of perplexed me because I think the more you study it, the more fascinating you become. Uh, but I do think it you definitely need some sort of, if not James Bond background, uh, background in the 60s spy mania craze that Bond really just exploded into the popular consciousness. But I think it also helps to have a good background in classic films so you recognize a lot of the faces in front of and behind the camera because the amount of talent is alone credited uh, is just absolutely staggering. This film has, without question, probably the greatest cast ever assembled for any film. Uh, and then on the other side of the camera, the, uh, the absolute uh, just insane amount of talent that went on uh, for the actual production crew. And this, again, is not even counting the dozens of people that we know of at least worked on the film or wrote on the film or contributed to it who were not credited, uh, even including the legend himself, Billy Wilder, uh, wrote drafts of Casino Royale, apparently. And this all was due to the fact that uh, the film's producer, Charlie K. Feldman, was the most pretty much the most legendary uh, agent in Hollywood at the time who really uh, pioneered a lot of things we now take for granted as commonplace today, such as the uh, packaging deals of stars with actors, d directors, and projects and scripts as one package to sell to a particular studio. So you basically build the package and you sell that as, as the uh, vehicle to the studio instead of just a script or a writer or an individual director or an individual actor or actress. And he was known as such a gentleman that everyone in the world loved him, which is, of course, I'm sure why he was able to uh, use his seemingly endless Rolodex to get so many people to even just do little bit cameos in the film. And unfortunately, I think the major problem is, of course, that Feldman himself was not really a producer, and it shows. Uh, he had had a great success previous to this with the film What's New Pussycat, which has a lot of similarities to the uh, sort of makeup of Casino Royale 67, and you can definitely see the parallel. So I think it's very helpful to see that film, which of course also starred uh, Peter Sellers and featured Woody Allen and had a similar sort of madcap ending that it built up to. And that was very successful and sort of uh, captured a new sort of emerging uh, film crowd, which what we would probably now call the college crowd or the art house crowd. It's sort of the sex farce of the 60s that, that had become popular, but with a sort of bits of an urbane edge that are sort of poking through not quite a, a European uh, a sex farce but it had it had tinges of that so it definitely was trying to appeal to a more maybe metropolitan audience again this this sort of college crowd that they were going for so with the success of that film and going into Casino Royale and and eventually dropping the notion of doing a, a straight Bond film and making it into a spoof is, is really, you, you can see where these ideas started to form in, in Feldman's head. And it, it made, it makes, to this day still, it makes sense why he did this. And uh, it, 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 it's probably the only thing <laughs> in relation to the film that actually makes sense. Uh, but that's, that's how the ball got started. And I do actually think Casino Royale is a, is a much superior film to What's New Pussycat, which is still enjoyable for what it is, but uh, I, I do think it's it's a much weaker film, actually. But of course, Casino Royale is so overstuffed with riches and insanity that it has enough to fill 30 other films. And I think it definitely takes multiple viewings to even soak in the madness that is going on in Casino Royale. I didn't start to really understand it until I had seen it 
three, four, five times. And still to this day, every time I watch it, I wind up finding something new that I just totally missed before because there's so much stuffed in here. And uh, I still would absolutely love to see some of the deleted material of which there is apparently just legions of film cans that are just sitting around somewhere, hopefully uh, not destroyed, that uh, we get little glimpses of here and there in production stills and some of the transitional pieces that they were forced to come up with simply because they didn't have the footage they needed and it was poor Val Guest left uh, as the last man standing to try and make some sense out of this madness. Now, of course, the film uh, was released at a runtime of 131 minutes, 2 hours, 11 minutes, and uh, it features, as uh, Stephen J. Rubin put it, you know, plot holes you could drive an Aston Martin DB5 through, which is, a, it, an, uh, even that is an understatement. But I do think that uh, Val Guest and the, and the editing team were able to piece together a, a certain energy that all of these scenes really didn't have when taken as as separate pieces and it, it manages to weave a sort of spell it's a strange time capsule it's a time capsule uh, unlike any other other film you'll ever come across because it is exactly of its time in 1967 because the film while is it, it, its goal is a, ostensibly to spoof the uh, James Bond phenomenon and the spy craze of the 60s. It doesn't stop there. It has no uh, specific frame set. That's that's where it starts, but it, it parodies and lampoons and references everything of that time period. So if you don't know a whole lot about, say, Swinging London or uh, the Beatles going to India or all of these uh, pop culture elements of the mid to late 60s, you're going to be very bewildered and also you're going to be uh, totally uh, up a creek without a paddle if you don't have at least some general knowledge of uh, you know some classic film knowledge because otherwise you're going to wonder okay uh, who, who is George Raft and why does he show up at the end and and why are all these cameos here and and what what's the significance of this and this and this so I, I think modern audience is coming in cold to this film I think that's why there's such an immediate knee-jerk reaction against it, because I, I experienced this. Uh, my, I've, actually, I've experienced it my entire life. Every time the film is brought up, um, especially now, everybody thinks you're talking about the official Eon adaptation, and when when you when they realize you're talking about the '67 spoof film, the Feldman film, uh, the people just immediately have a knee-jerk reaction of such negativity and. I, again, I do think that it, it re really requires multiple viewings. The first time I saw the film, it was included as part of a package, and I, I remember correctly, it was on the old school AMC that was actually American movie classics and not the uh, the crap that it eventually became. But uh, it was introduced, and they had the the little bumper on the front, you know, saying this was a James Bond film, not like any other James Bond film, with David Niven as Sir James Bond, and then the film started, and I was far too young to be to be seeing, and I was already a Bond fan, of course, and a fanatic, but I knew there was this this weird one from the '60s, and and somehow David Niven was was tied to it. But what followed, I just did, really didn't even comprehend it. It was just a bizarre experience seeing it the first time. And, of course, it was pan and scanned, and uh, it, I believe it had commercials too. So it wasn't until years later, and really until the DVD release, the first DVD release, that I came to the film fresh and you know, actually being able to somewhat comprehend the madness that was about to ensue and actually was able to see the film Letterboxd with its you know, mono sound mix and everything. And even then, the, the second time, the, the first time seeing it proper, really, uh, again, I didn't get half the stuff that was going on. I could kind of understand some of it, but it was, it was a bizarre experience. And so as time went on, I eventually tried it again. And I think with age and with rewatches, it, it, something finally clicked and I could finally get on the bizarre, strange Casino Royale wavelength. And so I did finally then, as the original ad campaign proudly proclaimed, I joined the Casino Royale fun movement. And ever since, I have regarded it as sort of a 60s time capsule, almost 
pop art, if you will. Uh, it is absolutely overstuffed and so eager to please that you can't help but be charmed by it, even if it is a bit slow in the in the first opening section, uh, particularly the, the whole Scotland sequence. Usually it, it definitely drags a bit, and that, that I think also turns people off. I know of many people who have never even made it through the entire film. But it's also a film that's never pretentious. That's something else that I find is very important because, again, it's so eager to please. There's so much going on. It is such an embarrassment of riches that even when it stops making anything even remotely close to sense, there are hysterical gags thrown out, a mixture of really witty one-liners and very high-concept jokes mixed in with some extremely well-executed slapstick humor and some just absolute goofball jokes. Uh, it is no coincidence that this film is the complete inspiration for the Austin Powers series in more ways than one, and there are many elements that have been lifted and copied directly out of this film for all three of the Austin Powers films. And I would actually also make the argument that uh, this film is so completely superior to all three of those, which I do enjoy for their own charms, but uh, this film never descends to a level of toilet humor and it also has again it has a real wit to it which is very surprising it is a witty comedy that is mixed in with an absolute slapstick goofball comedy and it's interesting to see how it sort of runs the gamut back and forth between those two almost at random and uh, oftentimes you have uh, those jokes mixed in the same scene in the same uh, in the same shot you'll have uh, a, a really high concept sort of urbane uh, comedy scene going on and then bang out of nowhere there's a complete you know uh, just immediate gut reaction laugh line right there so it, it, it is it is a completely surprising film experience every time you come back to it it also is a film very famously directed by five official credited directors the idea being that uh, Feldman thought it would be quicker and faster and more economical to have five directors shooting simultaneously as if they were leading their own film units. And now this is often derided and, and made fun of by everyone who starts to discuss the film. But really the idea was coming out of the, the rise in popularity of all these anthology films in the 60s. Uh, primarily yeah, they were very popular in Europe and, and you had, uh, there would basically be films about various themes with stories that were directed by famous names or art house names and would feature various stars, as many as they could get into a picture. Sometimes they would reappear in the other episodes. But the, the episodes themselves would only be connected by uh, a certain theme or an actor or actress or something, but otherwise would be relatively unrelated. And this was in vogue for some time in the 60s. So you can see again where Feldman was trying to pick up on a trending idea and honestly, it as an idea it sounds fine but in practice it, it, it didn't really turn out this so well and so of course the film feels to say the film feels disjointed is uh, this film is the literal filmic cinematic definition of disjointed and I say this with all the affection in the world because I absolutely adore this film I again I, it's after some point I think it may have taken about five or ten viewings but something finally clicked and now I absolutely adore it as as a particular experience you have to bring yourself onto the film's wavelength because if, if you can't quite get there it's going to be a very bumpy ride and I think this is, is the primary factor why so many people are, are unable to to come to terms with what the film is trying to do. I also think because it's so far removed from its release in 1967 that all of these references just fly over people's heads. And also it's always sold as a James Bond film. And even when uh, it has the original artwork on the cover and uh, even if people are aware it's a spoof film, they still always go in thinking that it's a James Bond film of some sort. And they're probably always trying to come in or at least expecting that's going to have some semblance of the uh, official Eon Films plot structure that uh, Richard Maybaum so perfectly honed to, uh, to a real art form over the years. And Casino Royale doesn't. 
And so you don't you don't even get the sort of framework of a Bond film. Although originally, if uh, Peter Sellers had stayed on and we had gotten the whole of the Evelyn Trimble character story, which is the the closest any of the film actually comes to doing Fleming's original novel, you can see where the the idea was that's how they were going to spoof the Bond formula by the Trimble character being sort of the normal everyday man who uh, gets put in Bond's shoes and then sort of follows the Casino Royale plot, which would have been a perfect idea. And I still, to this day, I don't know why they did just simply go with that. And uh, but I I think they got uh, Feldman got carried away with the idea of the anthology film and. Things just never went well for this film, which is putting it mildly. Uh, One thing led to another, to another, to another. And the key problem was that uh, Columbia was backing the film, and every studio wanted their own James Bond franchise of sorts. They wanted some competing way to get their foot in the door or to jump on the Bond wagon, as it's been named. So uh, Thunderball in 1965 was the height of the series' popularity, and you saw Bond knockoffs and Spy Mania take over all films and television airwaves. So if you didn't have a Bond-type thing to release and you didn't have a spy spoof to tie in uh, you had to come up with something so this was columbia's attempt and so they poured a significant budget to start with into the production but uh, again feldman's inexperience as a film producer really shows he was a great agent he from all indications was a a gentleman and a, a great person to be around and very charming but uh, being a film producer and keeping everyone focused and keeping the budget and the production on track was not really something he was experienced in. And this became a, a massive runaway production that wound up costing not only more than the entire budget of You Only Live Twice, the official Eon film that released in late 67 after Casino came out, but uh, You Only Live Twice cost about $9.5 million in 1967 dollars, and Casino Royale wound up costing about $12 million in 1967 money, which uh, even inflation adjusted today is massive, but back then it was one of the most expensive films ever made, and it's, it is just so overloaded and so full of opulence that you can see the money on the screen, but what you can uh, experience more is you can feel the money coming out of Columbia's pocket and you just going into the opulence that you experience. The sets are larger than life and kaleidoscopic, and the imagery is so bursting with color, and the, the costumes are so intricate, and so many faces appear, and it just seems to be a, a, a late-night uh, alcohol-fueled party that has never stopped in the middle of swinging London. It, it is an experience like no other, and I think you have to go into it with at least some degree uh, of, of knowledge of some of these outside factors, let alone how Feldman wound up with the rights to Fleming's first Bond novel and how this got separated from uh, the rest of the novels, Thunderball excluded, in the uh, official Eon deal with Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman and eventually United Artists. I guess I should go into that very briefly to to get it through here in the introduction. So essentially, uh, Fleming tried for many, many years and many failed attempts to get a film made out of his James Bond novels. Eventually, uh, Gregory Ratoff bought the rights for a one-hour CBS Climax television episode based on Casino Royale, Fleming's first James Bond novel. Uh, This was produced in 1954 for the CBS Climax series, starring Barry Nelson as James Bond, the uh, Americanized version of the character, and a highly uh, adapted version down to a uh, live television one-hour slot. It is what it is. Uh, It is a product of its time period. It's amazing we're able to even see it. Uh, But, of course, Ratoff uh, eventually decided to then uh, buy the rights... uh, in perpetuity and buy and buy it back from Fleming, and so he did this, and uh, Fleming sold it for a, a far too low of a sum. But of course, no one else had ever been interested. So eventually, uh, Ratoff passed away, and his widow uh, was settling his accounts and wound up selling the rights to Charles K. Feldman, who was one of the people who. Uh, was apparently a friend of Ratoff's, and Ratoff owed him some money, so the widow um, sold him the rights to Casino Royale. So that sat around for a little while longer, and of course, by the time Feldman decided he wanted to do something with it, the uh, deal had been made, and Eon had produced their first Bond films, and the Bond mania had already started. 
So Feldman started originally with the idea of producing a serious James Bond adaptation and doing the first novel, which of course is the one story outside of Thunderball that uh, Eon didn't have access to. Most interestingly, he originally had Ben Hecht write a serious, dramatic script based on Fleming's novel, and nowadays on the internet you can find some articles and information about it, and even, I think, some excerpts of his script, and it sounds absolutely incredible. Of course, Hecht himself is one of the most legendary of all Hollywood screenwriters, one of the greatest screenwriters who ever lived, somebody gifted with an incredible talent for writing motion pictures. So just the idea of Ben Hecht writing a James Bond film, a serious adaptation of a Fleming novel, is just absolutely astounding. Uh, But unfortunately, he passed away, and those scripts were never used. So when Feldman came around uh, to do his Bond film in the midst of Bond mania, he did, interestingly, actually try to get Sean Connery to come on board. Uh, Of course, that didn't work out and probably wouldn't have been a good idea to begin with. But uh, he did uh, meet with uh, Cubby Broccoli, who was an old friend of his, and uh, Egon tried to come to a deal with him, but Feldman essentially wanted uh, far too much of the percentage, and uh, they all shook hands and, and, and left on friendly enough terms, and Feldman was then left to sort of go off and do his own thing, whatever he could do with this one property. So the idea then was, of course, I think he did try for a little bit longer to do a serious Bond film adaptation, but, you know, nobody was really going to go for that with the success of the official films that were already taking the world by storm. And it quickly became apparent that this was just not going to work. So Feldman somehow hit upon the idea of then just going ahead and making the spoof to end all spoofs and making it into a James Bond spoof film which actually was probably the smartest thing he could have done. There were very successful spy spoof films uh, throughout the 60s, the the best of them being the uh, two Flint films that 20th Century Fox released with James Coburn, which are classics of their kind. So it it made perfect sense. It was probably the best thing he could possibly do with the Casino Royale uh, property rights at the time. But this is the point at which the whole project really started to gestate and eventually over an extraordinarily long time uh, morphed many times over into the film that we eventually got in its release version. Of course, the, the I'm sure there were miles of, of footage that Val Guest and the editors had to go through, so I have no idea what the rough cut would have looked like. I'm sure it was probably at least an hour longer than what we have in the film, and uh, I'm still curious to see like various script drafts and how this developed over time, if if anything ever even existed on paper, because the, the production was so chaotic, there's just no real way to know But essentially, that is the very shortened version of how uh, Charles Feldman wound up with the rights to Casino Royale and went from trying to make a serious James Bond film into making a spoof film. And during that process, he developed and produced and released What's New Pussycat, which was very successful, and sort of the madcap elements and farcical elements of that film, plus the talents of Peter Sellers, who was extremely popular at the time, that sort of got folded into the ongoing Casino Royale process and that's how it became more madcap and more farcical and the success of What's New Pussycat really pushed Casino Royale into uh, a different sort of territory. So with all that out of the way that is my sort of pre-ramble for the film. Uh, Again I I try to I try to get these uh, with the right amount of information in the beginning so that way I can sort of set the stage but this one there's just so much to cover and so much information out there and so many bits of trivia and so many urban legends that exist that have never exactly been verified. And also it's a film that has such a horrible reputation that so many people despise or have never seen and, and just automatically think is terrible. That it's a real surprise if if you're able to get on its wavelength and, and come to terms with how just absolutely wacky and insane it is, that it becomes a real charming ride that has so much uh, ele- so many elements of its time that it has a sort of old world charm almost uh, it is a relic of its uh, of the past of the 1960s and also it, it, because you see so many famous faces of not just stars but character actors and so many uh, famous uh, people in the crew uh, it, it becomes a sort of again a time capsule of that period of what everybody was doing at that time and so everybody gets their their little tiny 
shiny, uh, shining moment in the middle of this just absolute madcap, indescribable experience. There is no other film in the world like this. There will never be another film like Casino Royale. It is a -a one-of-a-kind experience. You have to see it for yourself. You have to figure out how you yourself will even react to this. And amazingly, for having such a terrible reputation, the film was actually successful at the box office. It did turn a a, a profit, uh, and uh, it did reach enough of an audience in 67. uh, And I think a lot of people went in with a lot of pre-existing notions and they came in and the film started and they were like, what the heck is going on? But eventually just kind of went with it. Uh, I'm sure people did storm out and request money back if, if they could. But I, I think by that time they had gotten in there and, and paid their money and, and gotten their tickets. They were in the, in the theater and there are genuine laughs scattered throughout the film. And for diehard Bond fans like myself, the film is littered with Bond references and in-jokes and also references to the Bond of the novels, which you mostly see in all of the Sir James Bond, David Niven scenes. We see James Bond driving his Bentley from the novels, for example. So there are also many nods to the Cold War, to uh, other intelligence services, uh, the more gritty, realistic uh, spies of Lakari and Lynn Dayton. Uh, those have a, a, there's a number of jabs at, at, at those spies in this film. So it, it doesn't just stop at spoofing Bond. It spoofs spies in general. It spoofs the spy craze. It spoofs the Cold War, the space race, uh, swinging London, uh, German expressionism. There is no uh, particular focus. Uh, Casino Royale makes fun of the human condition and, and, and uh, culture of 1967. There is there. It's a no holds barred experience. There is no guiding factor to uh, what it's going to focus on. And so that sort of madcap insanity, this this zaniness. I think really comes through and it it also adds to this film's peculiar charm. Again, there is and will never be another film like Casino Royale. And then lastly, my own sort of personal stance on this. I am a dyed-in-the-wool James Bond diehard. I, I reread the, the Fleming canon every year. I rewatch the original films every year. I am a tried and true Terrence Young man. Uh, my favorite films are the ones that stick closer to the Fleming material, uh, you know, with the best of the series being, you know, Dr. Noen from Russia with Love, the, the first two films directed by Terrence Young. Uh, that that is my bond of choice. I do appreciate the Guy Hamilton style. I do love the Guy Hamilton films, but my own personal taste is more on the Terrence Young side of the scale than the Guy Hamilton side of the scale. So I say all of this, and I absolutely adore this film, Casino Royale. It is a madcap experience like no other. It is a real treat for the Bond fan who can go in with an open mind and find all the little nuggets of Bond jokes that are real pointed barbs at the series, but affectionate ones. It's never tearing Bond apart or taking Bond down a peg or two. A lot of them are very satirical. And in looking at the the Bond formula that had been established, which was already painfully obvious in the 1960s. Uh, And so I, I think it's very important to look at those and understand that it's a it's a spoof of Bond, but it's it's laughing with the Bond experience. It's not trying to tear it apart or trying to say we're better than than you or this is getting old hat. Uh, and it's got absolutely indelible images. My one of my favorites being the the random room that's full of women being painted gold. <laughs> it's just absolutely bizarre and uh, just incredible. And of course, it's really being done. More of that uh, twelve million dollars going to good use, even for just a complete random blink and you miss it gag. So with all that out of the way, uh, go to a copy of the film if you wish to watch along with this commentary. Again, this is not meant to be a definitive history or making of the film. I think it would be impossible to do that in the space of a commentary. Um, This is just me in my usual no-frills sort of way talking you through the film and the various things that come through my mind as the film unspools. Uh, But this film is so full of information and things going on and things not making sense and people coming in and exiting with no explanation given. 
that you know you could see this film a hundred times and still be confused you could see this film a hundred times and still try and understand what's going on and how things were done and again the production is just legendary it's absolutely fascinating to study this film even if you hate it if you are a film fanatic and you love studying productions of films that went awry or films that went wrong this is one of the greatest examples to study you will learn so much about making a motion picture because really casino royale breaks every single rule if you look at this film and you do everything the exact opposite way of how this production went that's how you should make a movie. Basically, Casino Royale's production did everything wrong. <laughs> everything went wrong. Everything was the exact opposite of what you should do. And yet, somehow, somehow this darn thing actually manages to work. I may have had to see it five times before it really did, but if if you can get on its wavelength, and I have to say this is probably all due to Val Guest, who was a damn great director who has never gotten the credit that he so richly deserved who could have made a great James Bond film on, in his own right. And I think the best thing to have done was to have made a single straight spoof story uh, and have Val Guest direct it because his scenes are probably the strongest of the film. And he was the unlucky guy who had to somehow piece together and shoot extra little bits to try and make some semblance of sense out of this film. So he used the characters of Sir James Bond and Vesper Lynn, so the David Niven and Ursula Andrews characters, to try and make some sort of through line, narratively speaking, to, to run through and try to make some sense out of this mess. And then he was the one who had to work with the editing team to try and, and just cut it down to something somewhat releasable around two hours. And I, I really do think they, they pulled it off. It's absolutely bizarre. You can't question its logic. You can't question it narratively because if you do that, you're going to drive yourself crazy and you're going to have a terrible time. You have to sort of go with it and you have to let it just sort of wash over you. And again, it's probably going to take at least two or three viewings because you are not going to get everything going on the first time. You simply are not. I didn't. I don't think anybody can but uh, again, it, it's it's really cleverly done in a lot of places because you can see where things are missing or dropped, but how they try to gloss over it or, or make it flow with just not having any any footage to cut to uh, is is really incredible. It's it's in it very interesting just to study the editing of this film and how they had to try and piece it together. But it was Val Guest who was left the thankless task of of performing this seemingly impossible feat. And uh, my favorite anecdote about the film is Feldman at the end of it said to Guest, you know, I'm going to give you this credit because uh, you did so much great work for me. I'm going to say, you know, you were the supervising editor and director. And Guest told him, you know, immediately, if you do that, I'll sue you. Feldman says, why? To which Val Guest replied, people are going to look at this and say, this was supervised? I'll never get a job again in my life. So with that, that's my introduction for the 1967 Charles K. Feldman spoof film, Casino Royale. So uh, if you want to watch along, uh, grab your copy of the film and go ahead and queue it up over, uh, just past the MGM logo or any other logos that might be on your particular copy of the film. Uh, unfortunately, the Blu-ray is out of print for this. Uh, it really deserves a, a brand new 4K scan because this film is a beautifully shot film full of gorgeous color and sets and costumes. So it's a film that I know will never most likely come out on UHD, but uh, it's one of my absolute dream titles. It's a film that I think could look far better on home video. Uh, if you do have one of the later versions, I would say uh, definitely go to the audio options and select the original mono mix. There is a 5.1 remix on the DVDs and onward, but it really just sounds like the expanded... Uh, it's like an upmix expansion of the mono track, and it doesn't sound nearly as good as the original mono. Uh, there are reports that maybe this film did get a 70 millimeter blow up with six track mag stereo, which would be incredible because the score is so intricately recorded. It's one of the most beautiful sounding recordings I've ever experienced. And of course, the score is the unquestionable masterpiece element of this film. If you take nothing else from it, it has one of the great film scores of all time. It's so unbelievably lively and infectious and listen to on the original uh, Cold Gym Stereo LP, the USLP. It's one of the finest pieces of vinyl you can ever hear in your life. Uh, unfortunately, the tapes were damaged, so 
All the later reissues uh, don't sound anywhere near as good as the original LP, which is very tricky to find uh, in good condition because the Cold Jim's label is notorious for having very noisy pressings, but it is doable. I do highly recommend the original score. Uh, that being said, uh, Quartet Records did an anniversary release uh, just recently, and a couple years ago, and they used a, a safety master made before the tapes were damaged, and uh, it features almost the entire complete score of the film with all these expanded tracks. It sounds yeah, astoundingly close to that original Cold Gems LP and uh, is my recommended version to get if you can't find the original um, Cold Gems stereo LP and is essential for the extra tracks as well. I believe it's still in print, so uh, it's actually not very expensive and it sounds incredible. Uh, so uh, hats off to Quartet for that beautiful release. I know I'm plugging it, but I plug it a lot. It's one of the best CDs I own. Um, but yeah, the score is just absolutely sublime. So I would say go ahead and select the original mono mix. That's my technical note for the film as I usually make uh, some notes about the sound mixes where I feel it's necessary. I do think the best audio presentation is actually on the Litterbox 1994 Columbia Laserdisc released in the U.S. Uh, it's got the mono, and that transfer is actually reused for the first DVD, and then it was slightly spiffed up for the second DVD, and then that got slightly spiffed up for HD. So that's why the Blu-ray doesn't look super great, um, but unfortunately that's out of print, so you can't see it in HD unless you find a streaming version or you happen to find the Blu-ray. But I do suggest uh, selecting the original mono first. So with that out of the way, go to your copy of the film. Again, try and have it queued up in the black area after the um, just before you see the first image of the pissoir coming through. Uh, so just after the logos, that way we try to get a rough sync in about the same place. Again, uh, as always with these, these are not professionally recorded, so if it drifts a little bit, uh, that that's to be expected because everybody's copies are a little different, or if you're watching, say, a PAL DVD, the frame rate difference will cause the, the speed to be different. So you should be able to sort of follow along uh, with, with this rough sync and, and hopefully have an idea of what, of what we're discussing at any given time. So go to your copy of the film now, and we'll do the count in. So in five, four, three, two, one, press play now. So the first thing we see is this pissoir with Les Beatles written on it, so putting us right in the 60s. We see Mathis here uh, with an English accent, <laughs> strangely, and we get our first glimpse of Peter Sellers, the ostensible star of the film, as Evelyn Trimble. This is a sequence from much later in the film, and essentially starting the film with what seems like a, a, a joke uh, that's you know, very simple, that's just literally stolen out of later in the film, part of the sequence that was heavily cut, and then tacked on to the front as sort of a riff on the James Bond pre-title sequence. And that takes us into these beautifully uh, intricate animated titles and the iconic uh, main title theme performed by Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. That's giving us our main cast of famous faces. I, again, I've uh, these titles are so intricate. You you don't really get the full impact uh, unless you're really studying them. I think that you really have to see this on a big screen projected because you see all these little faces built into the uh, into the actual title uh, letters of each each credit, and each one is usually dealing a little bit with the character or the um, the department we'll see later on. Now, if you look very closely at the film footage, uh, you know, you see when they have the angel wings, that's the footage used in the ending. But you also see little glimpses of all the various cut scenes. So if you're very eagle-eyed, you can spot little bits here and there, like John Huston's credit is a footage we just don't see in the film because he's in different costuming. Now, the camera credit is, of course, very important because this film was primarily shot by the great Jack Hildyard and also shot uh, with many other photographers doing additional footage, including among them Nicholas Rogue before he'd become a famous director. These titles were done by Richard Williams, and again, they are very underrated and trying to do something intricate and striking visually to sort of at least stack up against the iconic Morris Binder uh, titles for the official Eon films, which have become legendary even by this time. Again, if you're into films at all, just looking at the names that, fl that flash by of, of the cast and crew, you see many stalwarts of the British film industry, many legendary names. Now the important credit for Burt Backrack and his score, Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass, 
the score comes across quite well in the mono mix. The, the mono mix is actually mixed really well for a 1967 film, but you don't get the full experience of the, the fidelity of the recording of this score until you hear it on in stereo because it is just unbelievable. Now we get the five director credits for John Huston, Ken Hughes, Val Guest, Robert Parrish, who of course replaced Joe McGrath when Joe McGrath was let go. <laughs> and then Val Guest gets the additional sequences credit. That's the little credit that uh, Feldman wound up giving him because he did far more than just additional sequences. What's interesting is we go right out of the titles and we go bang into this really cute visual gag with this very jaunty cue that uh, Backrack has written for us. It's a cue that gets stuck in my head all the time. But what's really great, this works on many levels because it's the different foreign heads of their respective uh, spy agencies, and each one of them comes up in a different car that's a foreign make. So they, they have the American car and the French car and the British car and the ostensibly Russian car. So their, their nationalities aren't just worn on their sleeves, but they're also you know reflected in the vehicles themselves. And, of course, they all meet up seemingly in the middle of nowhere in this beautific countryside and have to part this flock of sheep that's sitting in the road which is a bizarre image but uh the more you study this film the more you find all these little gags hidden in plain sight and these extra layers that don't exactly go anywhere because they're just there and they're stacked on top of each other so we see many famous faces here and john houston taking an acting part in this being the sequence that he started with uh, or he primarily did the Scottish sequence, but it's very hard to know where one director stopped and ended because, of course, uh, Houston left uh, when he was supposed to, and the shooting wasn't finished, so Val Guest said that he had to take over and sort of finish uh, not only Houston's part, but other parts as well. And, of course, Joe McGrath was uh, brought on by Peter Sellers and then eventually helped to get fired by Peter Sellers. <laughs> so uh, then Robert Parrish was brought in to finish... Uh, the McGrath scenes, and then those scenes were, I think, also eventually finished by Val Guest as well. Now, the thing with the lions here is it's, it's setting up the notion that they're going into the realm of the originator of the James Bond iconography, Sir James Bond himself. And the bit with the lions when the lion gets on top of the car here, and then uh, the music turns to a fanfare, it's really a riff on the film Born Free with its famous John Barry score, which was hugely popular uh, in uh, 1966. So, of course, that's a dated reference right there that most people today aren't going to get, and the film is littered with them. It also cracks me up that, you know, you have John Huston playing M, which is, you know, dream casting for classic Hollywood. And you have Bill Holden, of all people, playing Ransom, the, the, the C essentially the CIA head, who would have made an outstanding Felix Leiter in a 50s James Bond film. And that notion carries on here to our first glimpse of Sir James Bond doing very un-James Bond-like things, uh, as we would perceive, uh, played by David Niven. David Niven, of course, well known nowadays for being Fleming's choice for uh, a straight film adaptation in the 1950s. And to be honest, it's really a shame that Niven never got to play Bond straight because uh, I think you see flashes of, of the Bond character in some of his darker roles. Uh, and he was such the uh, ideal English gentleman with the, nece the, the necessary darker edge uh, that you saw, particularly in things like The Guns of Navarone, that uh, it, it, he was definitely part of the, the makeup of Bond's character, at least his, his screen image. So if you were making a James Bond film in the 1950s, there was no better choice. And Niven was f hugely underrated as a dramatic actor. Uh, you know, he did win the Oscar for separate tables, but he, he still was always perceived as more of a comedic actor, which he shows those chops off here in this film magnific magnificently. He, and he's never given credit for basically having to carry the film on his back for most of it, especially since uh, he and Val Guest and Ursula Andress had to do all of the linking sequences and try to make some sense out of this mess. Now... This is actually a really funny idea. It's a great, clever conceit that we're introduced to James Bond, but he completely eschews all the James Bondisms that are given to the 
newly assigned James Bond. So the James Bond we know of is actually just a guy assigned the code name to make sure that MI6 still has prestige on the world stage. And this is what Houston's M is explaining here. And also it's rather amusing that M now has flaming red hair and a big thick mustache. So it's it's playing already toying around with the Bond formula here. And they could have made a whole movie out of this. They could have made a whole movie out of the David Niven character. And that's kind of what Val Guest kind of started turning the movie into. And it probably, of course, it obviously would have been better had this been, you know, the intention starting out. Uh, but, of course, they had to essentially find this out by the end of production when they were trying to piece things together. I love this sort of unmasking of the various department heads with all their secret gadgets hidden away. You don't even, and it's all in the performance and and foleying in sound effects, and it shows James Bond, Sir James' disdain for what spying has become. And this is another interesting thing that's very high concept intellectual because uh, Sir James is a spy of history and is linked to Mata Hari. So, you know, that's something that you wouldn't really necessarily know unless you were a spy fan or a history buff. So it's a really interesting conceit to add to this concept on top of everything. It's an example, I think, of how this film is littered with all these high ideas and concepts that uh, the general public probably were you know, was just going to fly over their heads. And it's mixed in with, you know, goofy gags, too. Now we're setting up the uh, agents disappearing everywhere and that no one can save them except the original, the great spy himself, Sir James. And then we're playing again the uh, how everyone is linked in this time of crisis and they all don't want to admit their failures and their incompetence, but they are incompetent and they're just trying to keep a brave face, which that's 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 what sells the gag. It's also interesting in the middle of the Cold War that you have all sides operating on the same team. So there's 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 a bit of um, interesting political commentary there, I think. It's also interesting how it seems this concept of having to lure the original agent out of retirement and to come back and save the world, essentially. This has actually been used a number of times. I, I don't know if people are conscious of it, but it, it's actually a concept that seems to keep repeating over and over. So uh, there are a number of things in this film that I find echoes of, uh, even to this day. And and I, sometimes I start to think if I'm just crazy, but there it's it's odd that as reviled as this film usually is, it seems to have inspired a heck of a lot of people. Now we get the explanation of why Sir James retired and shut himself off from the world, that he lost the love of his life, Mata Hari, who of course is a real-life spy figure who was executed by firing squad and... You know, they essentially work her real life story, the historical event that happened into the film. And it, that's something that you just didn't see. It's still something that is rarely done. And it really helps to build and flesh out this sort of world that they're creating for this Sir James Bond. Of course, you know, Manahari was around in the time of World War One, so it starts to make you question the timeline of events and Sir James's age and things. But, of course, if you start down that path, you're going to drive yourself bonkers with this film very quickly. But uh, that's something I've always wondered about, you know, how, how exactly how old was Sir James in World War One? And, of course, the manner of which uh, M has decided to convince James, Sir James to come back after his reluctance is... You know, certainly overkill and definitely uh, results in M essentially killing himself uh, since he disappears at this point. Rather amusingly, his red toupee blows off, but uh, destroying Sir James's estate by mortar shells. And then he has to watch with stone grumpy faces. Everything's destroyed. And then immediately a hard cut. Uh, the first of the film's many hard cuts to, to cover up giant edits or scenes missing. So now we immediately cut to this very intricate smirsh control room. I have to mention this shot here, the shot of Sir James driving the classic Bentley of Fleming's novels. But it looks like this is the setup for the car chase, actually, that comes at the end of the Scotland sequence. 
And since they didn't have any shots of Sir James driving to McTerry Castle in Scotland, they had to just simply use the establishing bit of uh, what was going to be for the car chase, which comes after this sequence ends. So that's another example of having to use little bits here and there for just shots you simply didn't have. So I think originally there was a bridging sequence between the destruction of Sir James's house and M's death, and of course finding the toupee, which is Bond's reason for coming to McTerry Castle, uh, and then picking up with the uh, the the Smirsh Piper. And of course the gag there is you know oh uh, Agent Mimi has the best Scotch accent. They immediately cut to Deborah Carr, you know, one of the most famous actresses in the world at the time, uh, who you know really goes full tilt for the comedy here and of course has great rapport with david niven they had been in a number of films together um but of course you know born and you know she was scottish so that's that's the gag there's there's many little things like that that if you don't know uh, particular things about certain people's reputations or what they were famous for you're not really going to understand why the film suddenly does these weird things uh, later on, what happens to the Mimi character when she decides to, uh, you know, go join a convent and become a nun? Well, that's a play on one of her most famous film roles, which was in uh, the Archer's film uh, Black Narcissus in 1947. Now, this is one of those little bits that makes me think that it may have come from Billy Wilder because the, the film definitely slows down here. And it's very easy to miss the gag that uh, Bond has come, Sir James has come here for the funeral of M, and the only thing that is left is his toupee. It's just a hysterically bizarre thing, and I wish there was... There, there needs to be payoff. Unfortunately, we don't get the actual funeral where they're having to just bury a toupee in, like, a full grave. But it makes me immediately think of the the the, the funeral scene in Sunset Boulevard where uh, Joe Gillis comes on to Norman Desmond uh, burying uh, something, having a funeral. Of course, it's her dead pet monkey. And that is also sort of played up here with the, the randomness of the goat being brought in and being carried off by all these beautiful red-handed girls, which the house is filled with. The idea being to break down even the most uh, cultivated of gentlemen, to break Sir James Bond's image, and by uh, destroying his celibacy, by tempting him with so many women. And this, of course, is again... Furthering the gag, we got established earlier that this is James Bond at his purest and without any of the James Bondisms, including his famous libido. And I'm, it, Niven carries this whole sequence as he does all of the uh, all of the parts of the film that he's in, and the best moments come from his comedic timing and how he plays this trying to maintain uh, a celibate image, something that you'll see, you know, turn up in many films, most notably uh, the hilarious sketch with uh, Michael Palin and Monty Python and the Holy Grail, uh, where the, the, the lost knight turns up in the castle filled with beautiful virgins <laughs> who all uh, want him terribly. But of course here, all of these are actually Smurfs agents and we can see how, uh, apparently, the entire male agent uh, population of all the respective spy agencies have been eliminated because, you know, all of these women for one man, you know, it's it's definitely overkill, but uh, it's it certainly uh, shows just the links at which uh, Smirsh is ostensibly going to. And you may ask yourself, why uh, are we talking about Smirsh when, you know, at the beginning we saw the uh, Russian head of the KGB, uh, you know, as one of the uh, threatened, concerned spy agency heads? Well, I, I would assume that uh, since Smirsh was one of the major players in Fleming's original novel and, of course, the uh, major villain force in the, the majority of Fleming's books instead of Spectre, because this is before he had created the organization, um, that's one of the few holdovers left in the film from the original novel, but also because Kevin McClory had won the rights to the Spectre organization. So they couldn't use Spectre unless they had made some sort of deal with McClory, who had made an exclusive deal to do Thunderball. So I think it was just off the table, and they just kept it as just plain Smirsh and just never went into it. Backrock's score cue here is really nice and helps to carry the events going on because this this sequence is actually very slow you can tell the whole pace of the film has completely ground down to a screeching halt 
Uh, again, this is the part of the film where most newcomers really get thrown. Uh, it's it's an older style of comedy, but it has really great little nuggets in it. This is one of my favorite bits where Sir James goes to get in the bath and there's this beautiful young girl played by Angela Scular, who of course would turn up in Honor Majesty's Secret Service as Ruby Bartlett. And she's absolutely wonderful in this with Niven and the the way that she pitches her voice and just is, you know, kind of grinning like an idiot, but they, they play this gag out to the hilt that Sir James is the ultimate gentleman and he's trying to get in the bath, but it's all done in physicality. And I love this, even this little bit here where you see all of the nudes on the walls and things. And of course the, the line earlier, um, you know, your, your, your daddy meaning M was a, was a definitely a different man in Whitehall. So there, there's a joke within the joke that uh, M was apparently a, a bit of a, a bit of a, a strange individual at home. And then you get the gag with turning on the cold water tap, which actually is sort of a pull from Fleming because in the original novels, Bond famously would take a scalding hot shower and then immediately switch over to cold water to shock his senses awake. So that's, that's I, I'm sure that wasn't a pull from Fleming, but it almost feels like it. And I love that they include in the staging that Niven has to turn around naked in the bathtub. And then when he goes to sit down, he accidentally slides down further and his eyes go wide. <laughs> And then we get this whole bit where she's interested in medical terminology and they, they just play this joke to the hilt uh, with essentially putting the two completely naked in a bathtub as physically close as they possibly can and still Niven is able to carry off with the ultimate in uh, gentlemanly conduct. And this is setting up the fact that their uh, Smirsh keeps up backup plans. So it's setting up the homing button for later on in the grouse hunting sequence. And then as if things weren't weird enough, I like the fact that they're you know speaking another language and they actually subtitle it with hard uh, hard coded subtitles in the film that adds a certain uh, sort of worldliness. It's just an extra little touch of the bizarre. But then we go into this sequence where everybody uh, seemingly as part of the funeral rites gets absolutely plastered and dances around and we have bagpipes and a bunch of kilts and Scottish seeming things, but it, it, it makes absolutely no sense. And uh, again, the, the, the film has ground to a halt at this point. The, the only thing this scene really serves to do is establish Mimi as the lead of, of this group of Smurfs agents and the fact that uh, Sir James is able to ostensibly hold his liquor very well because uh, he drinks plenty and then, you know, carries the bottle off with him at the end. He remains the steadfast English gentleman at all times and is unflappable. Uh, but again, it's interesting to see Deborah Carr throw herself into this, and that's one of the charms of this film that you see a bunch of stars just freely cracking up and and just going full tilt into wackiness. Some of it's more effective than, than others, but it's also something you just didn't see every day. Now here's the gag with everybody starting to, you know, totally pass out under the table. I like that the music continues a bit, and then Sir James just gets up with a sort of shrug of the shoulders and wishes everyone a good night. And most importantly, he pauses, turns back, and he takes the bottle with him as if he had still not drank enough and needed a nightcap. Almost makes me think of the famous moment in Thunderball where Bond pauses in Count Lippy's room and steals the grape uh, on his way out. And then we cut to this beautifully ornate bedroom with all these glowing reds and what do we see but sir james complete with peaked nightcap uh enjoying his beverage and and a nice uh, volume of i don't know what it is he's reading but uh, it's definitely not the uh, james bond we're used to and now mimi has come in to invoke her widow's rights and she starts throwing herself at him and 
we get more of this gag of the celibate Sir James who tries to find the most gentlemanly way of uh, disarming all of these women and and uh, letting them down without um, uh, injuring injuring their pride. <laughs> The fun of the sequence comes in the fact that it, we, we've established the celibacy of Sir James Bond and the fact that we know that Mimi is a sleeper agent, so all of this stuff is manufactured uh, to tempt James Bond, and now they're using an element of trying to invoke a, a, a sense of duty because apparently just filling a house, uh, a castle full of beautiful women didn't work. And it's also interesting to note the stutter that uh, Sir James affects. And uh, one of my favorite gags in the film is simply when he decides to stop using it because he's uh, back in active business all of a sudden. And I don't know if that's because Niven just felt like not doing it anymore. It's so throwaway, but that's, of course, why the stutter disappears. Then another random gag where she pulls the, the horn off the wall and it's completely dubbed in with an overblown uh, horn piece and now all of a sudden she's yelling about you've been challenged to wrestle of course we have no exact idea what exactly this is or means and then Backrack picks up with this jaunty little cue again that matches Sir James's sort of rolling up of the sleeves and he leaves his drink on the stuffed bear because, of course, the house is filled with stuffed hunting trophies. Since this is supposedly M's castle, I have to wonder if that's an in-joke for uh, John Huston being a famous game hunter. And I love the fact that he still is just in his pajamas. <laughs> he didn't even take the time to change because well, why bother? We get more of the horn gag, which never fails to crack me up. It's just totally an extra random little uh, extra note of just kookiness. And now the bit with the giant stone balls with this wonderful Bacharach sort of theme that he created for Sir James. This sort of work-like, methodical little bit of just whimsical music that suggests the perplexed state that Sir James finds himself in this absolute castle full of eccentric craziness. Of course, now all the gags are that the others are incapable of doing this wrestling, but it's it's never simple. Uh, you know, they do full on cartoon style gags. Like the, the they don't just drop the ball; they drop the ball and fall over backwards, and it smashes through the floor. And then this poor fellow seemingly pulls his entire back out, and they fully in this really <laughs> painful sounding pop. And then on top of that, he hobbles off, still bent over. <laughs> it's just. No, no joke here is ever simple. It's always got some extra build up to it. And then finally, some guy is actually able to pick the darn ball up. But, you know, while we're watching this, while, you know, the, the, the gags are simple, they're still effective, and this is giving us the requisite uh, example of, of Bond's, uh, you know, at least Sir James's skills have not diminished with age and time and retirement. When you look at when, the, when, when he falls and hits the swords and everything, I always have to think, uh, especially when that charge goes off, that <laughs> doesn't look very particularly safe. And then, of course, after this, Mimi has fallen in love and immediately starts spouting French, which, again, we get more subtitles. 
I, I love the whole idea that uh, she's immediately turned. I think that's probably a reference to Bond's turning of Pussy Galore and Goldfinger. But of course, uh, here, Sir James didn't need to sleep with anyone. He just is that amazing. And that that's another gag that sort of runs through all the Sir James scenes that he's really amazing without even having to do anything. And he seems to be really, uh, along with Bess Berlin, just about the only person in the film that uh, has some sense of the real world and is essentially the straight man for all the gags and all of the scenes. And Niven does all this with a plum, like even blowing off the fist after randomly karate chopping, <laughs> chopping the stone ball. The extra little beat of the whole phalanx of beautiful redheads closing in on Mimi after she has been turned and been discovered. So now we go into the grouse shoot sequence. First, we're confronted by this very striking image of all these beautiful girls in matching outfits uh, standing in a converted VW bus with this ever-elaborate uh, mechanism that we then discover is for shooting the robotic tr homing tracking uh, explosive laden fake grouse. <laughs> it's an extremely elaborate way to kill Sir James. And we get, it, even right there, a beautifully composed shot of the, of the girls spread out walking over the hill, supposedly to drive out the grouse. And then here, we, you get uh, this maudlin scene of Mimi locked in the tower room, pining for Sir James and how he's going to be killed almost as sort of a an in-joke on the same sort of scene in like a classic swashbuckler. Like you could imagine it being a riff on uh, Maid Marian worrying about Robin Hood and Adventures of Robin Hood. And then immediately the score goes from that sort of maudlin string cue to this very jaunty uh, rendition of the title theme. Now, of course, this being a film from the 60s, there are a number of opticals, this being one of the most unconvincing when Deborah Carr's hanging on the, the pipe that comes out from the wall. But of course, she couldn't just escape from her room normally. This is Casino Royale. It's got to have extra beats and be just completely quirky. And so after letting Sir James shoot down some regular birds, we immediately start firing off these hand-painted, very... I, I, I mean, they went to the effort of making these look bird-like. There's nothing in this film that is simple. And I like how we get this nice trail off of a sort of brass section, and it's one of the moments in the score where it does get John Barry-like. I think that was a definite nod to John Barry's Bond sound. And then for, you know, opticals, th these, these aren't horrible with the birds flying over and then they're actual live explosions. And I like how Sir James just nonchalantly is totally apparently aware of what's going on and just takes in what Mimi is saying and it's just like, oh, well, I'm going to continue on anyway. <laughs> and if this scene didn't have enough of the ridiculous in it, we get an extra little bead of danger with shooting off one wing when Bond is inadvertently blinded. But now we go into another level of the bazaar where it becomes a sort of slingshot game back and forth by using Bond's braces to fire the homing button back and forth. And of course, you can see the wires on the, the uh, explosive grouse pigeons, obviously. <laughs> I like how Mimi just adoringly says failing all of this we were to kill you and now we get the bizarre in full force with this slingshotting back and forth of the homing button and this goes on you know several times and they just go back and forth and have to keep tracking it down and finding it before they get blown to bits which is just a, another element of the bizarre that just gives another level to this sequence. It wasn't just enough that Bond would escape a, uh, a murder attempt and turn it back on, his vill on, on the villains trying to kill him, but it wasn't henchmen. It was beautiful girls and matching outfits. And then another 
total riff on a classic swashbuckler scene. The lady's wounded. She seems like she's dying. And then you see Niven literally go down and take her in his arms. And they're doing classical Hollywood style posing. She starts touching his face. And Niven is so wonderfully dashing. And the, the music comes in with that modeling cue again. And it's a total riff on, you know, the, the heroine of the film is supposedly dying and the hero will have to carry on gallantly without his lost love. And what, what's, what totally sells it for me, what never fails to crack me up, uh, when, when you, the audience, along with Sir James, suddenly go, Madam, are you quite sure that you're dying? <laughs> it's just... It, it totally pulls the rug out from this this little riff on classical Hollywood storytelling. So it's it's another thing that I'm I'm sure maybe I don't know if everybody's going to get in in the modern time, but it's it's a complete takeoff on uh, again something that is totally not James Bond, but uh, you know something that obviously inspired Bond. And then to further the gag even more, it's not that she's dying. She's giving up her life and joining a convent, and it just happens to be one that's over that hill. <laughs> Ever so convenient, and then she just walks away. And as if that wasn't enough, we then pull to the wide shot, and Bond is standing there with his pants down and falls over because, of course, they, they had to use his uh, braces earlier on. So now we cut back to that Smirsh control room and we cut back to the footage of Bond and his Bentley, which they used, I believe, the establishing chunk of this for uh, Bond's arrival in Scotland. So they took that piece out of this and now we cut back to this. And of course, it's obviously Niven in front of, uh, you know, in front of a process screen. But really interestingly, all of the live footage of the cars is really well done because, of course, this was actually shot by the uh, second unit director who uh, worked on the original Italian job. So that, that actually helps make this sequence work. It's one of the great little bits of action in the film. And it starts pretty well, and, and you have this wonderful uh, smirch that has a complete recreation of the city streets. And I think the gag here was uh, you see all the little cars, and they, they look like they're, they're really recreations of slot cars, which were really uh, had become very popular by this point in the 60s. And it's kind of bizarre seeing a child's toy being used in this sort of scenario. And then we have the gag coming into this what would be normally just an action sequence of the driverless milk float truck and you know it helps sell it because this is really done with a milk truck without you know a guy sitting behind the driver's seat of course you know they had to rig stuff up uh, but it helps sell the sequence that you really have these cars going around and we have the visual to show the the detonators for the bombs that come out and then doing this retracting business sets up the end of the sequence where Bond will be able to use his driving skill and his ingenuity to get in front and get out of position and then use the milk float to destroy the potential assassin. So this is a beautifully constructed scene uh, that would work in a James Bond film, maybe without the, the element of the whimsical with it being a driverless milk float, but the actual Bond using his skills to get out of a dangerous situation and not relying on a Q-branch gadget... Uh, again, this is going back to Sir James being the classical spy and using his wits. But it's it's a great sequence. It's extremely well put together. Uh, it's one of the best bits in the entire film. And the film is littered with these. But they're you know very inter, uh, unconnected to one another. This is ostensibly Bond trying to get out of Scotland. And apparently Smirsh has decided to just go ahead and kill him. They're not trying to disable his uh, celibate image anymore. They're like, oh, that didn't work. Let's just kill him. And, of course, the bit there with the, uh, the traffic to get through has caused the malfunction and the milk float, so now they don't have visuals. And the best gag here is that they decide to ignore uh, the repeated cries of their agent, and then when the radio goes out, she can't, they can't hear her cries. Of course, Bond uses his gate key to trap her, and then she gets her comeuppance here. And there's a little zoom in on the optical, which obviously looks a little fake, but it is very dramatic. And then the explosion is quite nice because, again, it is practical. And then we're left with a final Sir James. 
So now we're finally out of the Scotland material, and that takes up you know a great chunk of the film. Uh, but here we do finally, with that car chase, we finally start to pick up the pace, which is really beneficial. So I know the Scottish sequences are usually a slog for most people. And then this gag here with the new Miss Moneypenny is a, is a gag that was completely lifted and used in the first Austin Powers film, where Bond actually... He actually kisses Money Penny, and then is like, "I'm her daughter." And it's like, uh, "Oh," <laughs> and you see here, this is where uh, Sir James starts to redecorate the office in his own style, and this is the bit where he drops the stuttering. Oh, no time for that now! And then, it, so the whole bit of the stuttering is just an affectation, uh, a sort of playing the role of being the retired English gentleman who's gone to his country estate. And then the Hadley character is sort of the Bill Tanner of the film, who, of course, has never really been used very much in the, in the films. And then they repeat the gag of, now, it's not just Moneypenny being her daughter, but Hadley is the son of his father, doing the same exact role. Now, this is one of my favorite gags in the film. The, the board of agents and the, and the voice that he affects, all of them die in sexual connotations. This is my favorite. Garroted in a geisha house. And apparently the real James Bond we know is doing television. Nice jab at the official Bond. And then here we go into our first glimpse of Sir James's nephew, the rather disappointing Jimmy Bond, on his ill-fated mission where he's being led to a firing squad. This is the first of the Woody Allen sequences that were all handled by Val Guest. This is one of the best pieces of the film with some of Woody Allen's most inspired dialogue. He rewrote all his own dialogue and spent months waiting around to shoot anything and saw so much excess and waste going on that it helped to inspire him to keep his, his own films eventually uh, far. that became very famous for being very low-budgeted and very economical. Well, that was entirely inspired by his experience on this film. And... Every line of dialogue is just hysterical here. It would help if I said I was pregnant and, you know, can't have bullets entering my body at any time. Then he uses an explosive cigarette to get out of a situation. But the best gag is, of course, he goes over the wall and we get a nice reveal of he's in front of a different firing squad. <laughs> and then we immediately cut away. So we, of course, think that he is eliminated by the other firing squad. But we find, of course, by the end of the film and a... And a very surprise reveal that, of course, he did escape. Now, you can see how all of the Niven Sir James sequences are used to try and inject some sense of logic into the rest of the scenes that we have. This is setting up the notion we see in the film of trying to create an anti-female spy device which leads us to the cooper character and eventually and the next time we see sir james when he names every character in the film james bond 007 this is a rather amusing take on the traditional going through all of the test subjects and in, interestingly, we have the genders flipped instead of it being the, the male who is going through trying to find the desirable female. It's the female going through all of these various guys who have interesting ways of getting crossed off the list. And of course, when the right one embraces her, all the lights go red and the music goes softer and a bit more intimate and then we immediately cut to them in bed together in a very Bundian type moment and of course calling him Coop is uh, I think it has to be a nod to that being Gary Cooper's famous nickname it's unfortunately the Cooper character that gets the 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 worst part of Casino Royale because of course uh, he would have been the primary James Bond type had this been a traditional James Bond spoof with a James Bond character running throughout. But 
uh, by the time they eventually settled on the Sir James portion, the Cooper character got you know cut down in terms of screen time. And then eventually, in the finished film, most of his sequences are removed. So he's here, he's introduced, we see his anti-female spy training uh, in, in a minute. But then, you know, after a certain point, he just disappears until he reappears at the ending when they're inside the casino base complex. And then tying into the to that scene, we see Moneypenny being tired and distracted. <laughs> and here we're introduced to the everyone being named Sir James, uh, being named James Bond 007, because it will confuse the enemy and no one will know what is going on. And again, that's a little bridging scene, and it, you just insert it to try and get something out of it. Now here in the training sequence, the first girl that comes up is, of course, in a white bikini with knife. It is a direct nod to Ursula Endress as Honey Rider and Dr. No. But interestingly, the gag here is they embrace. And then Cooper is very cool about it, and then... Instead of continuing, simply judo flips her over his shoulder, which is completely unexpected uh, for uh, even for this time. It's just not what you would expect James Bond to do. So it, it's it's a, it's a fun little scene, and of course, as you see in practically every moment of this film, the entire set is filled with practically every single beautiful woman they could get to appear in any sequence. That's another thing you'll see in this film. Every shot. Every sequence has gorgeous women almost as part of the set decoration. So here is Dahlia Lavi as the character known as the detainer, the super female uh, agent who is able to infiltrate anywhere and charm any man. And of course, it proves even impossible to get past Cooper's anti-female training. But just like Cooper, after this point, she disappears until the end of the film, where she just randomly reappears, and she's been captured by the evil Dr. Noah, and then disappears again. <laughs> so this is another point where we see characters who are introduced, and they just disappear because the footage just simply isn't there. So now we come to a scene that I'm, pr I'm sure is part of the reshoots. This is our introduction to the Vesper Lind character, and this is starting the sort of using her as the other bridging character with Sir James. So again, it's impossible to really know what scenes were shot where, what was part of the very original continuity script, if there ever was one for the shooting. But uh, of course, all of these had to be carefully poured over to then figure out how they could possibly shoot additional material to use this, to use these two characters to try for Valgas to tearing his hair out to try and come up with something to do with them uh, because he figured, and quite correctly, they were his best bet in terms of the characters to use to get something usable. So, of course, Vesper Lynn comes right out of Fleming's original novel, but this really is just taking that character's name and applying it to uh, eventually by the end of the film is revealed to be a villainess with the uh, with the reshoots and Peter Sellers walking off and that's what her character became but it seems that maybe at first she was just supposed to be duplicitous or I don't know if she was supposed to be the villainess of the film when they originally started but there is a duplicity in in the character that's really interesting and and there's a wonderful byplay between uh, Andrus and Niven. And of course, it must be mentioned that Andrus here is using her actual voice. She was dubbed in Doctor No in most of her early films because she had a very thick accent. And then she worked extremely hard to uh, perfect her English, and so actually had it in her contract that she couldn't be redubbed. So we go from that scene into the first of the Evelyn Trimble scenes, this being really how the film originally started, with this character being sort of brought into the James Bond world and then doing the sort of plot of Fleming's novel of getting to the big game against Le Chief and the casino, but it being the spoof elements coming from it being a normal glasses-wearing sort of nerdy guy having to play being James Bond. Of course, he's selected because he is apparently the world's expert on Baccarat. He even wrote the uh, Evelyn Tremble pamphlet on how to uh, win at Baccarat. But of course, he's introduced in this seedy sort of London nightclub casino. And out of nowhere, Ursula Andrus just walks up. And immediately, there's a, a sight, soft haze 
and the photography, and it is so completely full of sexual innuendo. She's gripping the handle of the slot machine, and they're in close proximity to, to each other. Their noses are almost touching. And at the right moment, she pulls the handle, and their lips get almost to the point of touching. And then musically, we hear the first uh, inference and the first strains of the iconic uh, The Look of Love, which will pop up when uh, they get to uh, Vesper's apartment. And of course, Tremble is just left there speechless. Well, this is another piece that was uh, that's a remnant of a sequence that was cut. Here, uh, Andrus is getting rid of a body. Ostensibly, it was supposed to be maybe 006, and actually played by Ian Hendry, who, of course, uh, is famous for being the original uh, partner of John Steed in The Avengers and you know, many other uh, great British films. But uh, he's one of the many people that uh, did apparently shoot stuff for this film, and it was either never finished or just removed. But it's, it's still, a, a, even if it, though it's a remnant, it's a hysterical gag that apparently Vesper Lind is such a, uh, uh, a, a man-eater type of character that she just has corpses that she has a deep freezer for. So as soon as they enter, the song comes up, you know, one of the most iconic songs ever recorded with the absolutely spine-tingling Dusty Springfield uh, vocal. This is actually a particular mix for the film. It's different from the, um, the stereo album version. And then this scene in front of the fish tank in slow motion when you see Vesper's beckoning finger, uh, I mean, it's just, it becomes iconic, even though it's, it's absolutely bizarre when you think about it. Why are they at a fish tank? You see Trimble look at it like, what the devil? Yeah, it's just, I guess, an, another example to show that... Uh, Vesper is ridiculously wealthy and just does all kinds of stuff, whatever she feels like at the time, as we get furthered with her purchasing uh, Nelson's statue and having it sitting outside, uh, that being something that uh, you probably won't notice unless you're paying attention to the dialogue, but you can literally see out the window, you see the figure of Nelson's statue. And that's actually a gag they wound up lifting or, or Probably not lifting. I don't think they were conscious about it, but that's a, you see the same gag in Moonraker when Bond says, "Why didn't Drax buy the Eiffel Tower as well?" And then they further it, you know, by uh, Corinne saying he did, but the French government refused him an export permit. Well, here Vesper Lind has bought Lord Nelson's statue and have it, had it moved outside her apartment. I must say, I've always loved that shot of the apartment and where Sellers is walking around looking confused. And then we see the little pink handkerchief come out and we hear, hello. And only then do we get the reverse shot and we see this massive sort of rectangular sofa down in the floor. And of course, Ursula at her most come hither uh, in this sequence, which is entirely just filled with, sensuality and sexual innuendos out the wazoo to the point where it, it it's it's so overdone that it has an element of of comedy to it and of course Evelyn Tremble is so completely outmatched here he is clueless at this point and there's something about Seller's performance here he was not in the best place mentally at this point in his life he was never the easiest person to work with he was a very, very troubled uh, individual at this point in 1967. And of course, uh, in 1964, he suffered a near fatal heart attack that uh, uh, really, it, it, he did technically die for a certain period of time and then was brought back and then had many health problems for the rest of his life. But uh, that didn't you know, help matters. But uh, what's interesting in his performance, he is... Some people have made the claim that, oh, he wanted to play a serious James Bond, and so he played it without any comedy, which is very untrue. There are many things that uh, counter that idea. But it's interesting to look at his performance because he's really going for a characterization. He's really investing feeling and creating this very nerdish, uh, unlucky guy with you know, down to the thick glasses and stuff. And Sellers was always most comfortable when he could assume a, a role. He never wanted to play himself. He always described himself as a chameleon. He had to have something to hide behind. And 
I think Trimble is one of his best performances, even though it's he walked out on the production and Trimble just suddenly disappears. It's it's unfortunate that it went that way because I really do think he's trying to invest something of himself in this character, and I think it I think it really works. And you get the the comedy comes from him just reacting to the the insane surroundings and the danger he's caught up in. So we fade into Vesper's bedroom, and this is a sequence I never understood until I heard the uh, the official commentary that Stephen J. Rubin and John Cork did. And John Cork describes this as sort of a visual gag, where uh, it, you have the Trimble character doing uh, push-ups and physical physically exerting himself, and then you have the Vesper character in this beautiful slow motion shot, diving or jumping around on the circular bed with the with the flower petals going in the air. So. According to Cork, it's sort of a, a visual gag metaphor for the different visions of the actual sexual act itself. Men usually viewing it as sort of physical exertion and work, and 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 the from the feminine perspective, supposedly being very uh, poetic and and romantic and fantastical and things like that. Um, again, I totally didn't understand that for the longest time, but that definitely seems to make the most sense. And then it just to make things more wacky, when uh, Vesper is photographing uh, Evelyn, we even have, as they're revolving around, we have the the actual image flipped upside down. And of course, another uh, lift that Austin Powers made is the rotating bed and the character in glasses, sort of writhing around the rotating bed with a with a beautiful woman in tow. And then, of course, uh, they invented this sequence where Peter Sellers dons a array of different bits of clothing and comes up with different characters and then bizarrely starts doing world leaders and I've never understood why they felt the need to insert him doing Hitler here it's such a knee-jerk bizarre it, it always makes me pause I, I, I and then of course he's still playing Trimble while dressed up as these characters and Vesper's still doing these uh, very come hither looks and and lines of dialogue while she's starting to pump him for information and lay out the elements of her ensnarement, trying to trap him into this plot to battle the sheaf at the Baccarat tables at Casino Royale. And I like how randomly they they do this whole bit with uh, the the camera terminology, but. Trimble being dressed up as Napoleon is worth it, if only for the fact that he pulls out a brochure that says Sunny Elba, which, of course, was where uh, Napoleon was exiled to and eventually died. <laughs> you know, it's just, just the right element of the bizarre. And, of course, only a, a history buff is going to get that. But I so love that they did that as well. And then we immediately cut back, and, and Sellers is dressed up as the famous Toulouse-Lautrec, right down to having the shorter stature so you know that he's probably having to crouch down somehow but they've done the whole thing with hiding his legs and then Vesper comes up and uses a light meter and then tells him what a uh, light reading she's going to give him and then I love the line that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me it's just completely bizarre it, it makes no sense but for some reason I guess Vesper Lind in this film is also a camera buff I do like this moment, though, where this they just drop the charade. We see the, how the legs were hidden in the special cut-off pants and everything. And then he starts to disrobe because, of course, he sees that he thinks at this point in time he's just been played for a fool. And the reason why he gets mad is because he thinks she's making fun of the one thing in his life that he's good at. He's such a loser that the only thing he has is he knows how to play Baccarat. Otherwise, he, he sucks at life. And then Vesper shows that she's genuine by flashing an attache case full of cash. But of course, if you look closely at it, of course, it's a black attache case with gold fasteners and a red interior to reference the classic from Russia with Love black attache case with gold fasteners and red interior. 
So we cut from Vesper's bedroom to Q Branch, but we are missing how this scene was originally supposed to open. The gag is that uh, Q Branch here is located under Herod's, the idea being the joke of Herod stocks everything, literally everything. So, of course, Q Branch would be located underneath Herod's. And originally they were going to go through and uh, you were going to see the head of security we see in a display. So the gnome character was going to follow them through Herod's and into the secret underground Q branch. But apparently they just didn't even shoot the Herod's material. So there's there's a little bit of reference to it here, but they just never shot that. But that's that's what the joke was supposed to be. I have to say, though, the set design is a really clever rendering of the classic-looking Q branch with the concrete walls and the sort of bunker-like appearance with the fluorescent lighting that we first saw in Goldfinger. And what makes this scene so beautiful is the fact that they go for the absolute ridiculous in every way. So we see not only the head of security dressed up like a garden gnome climbing around, who is completely obvious, but in the background we see guys in wetsuits firing bows and arrows. We see all this crazy stuff going on. And then if you look there when on the close-up shot of the gnome uh, character, uh, there's a little tag that reads, the James Bond toadstool, patent pending. Now, of course, we see here with the hat gun, uh, of course, uh, things aren't always perfected. And it's also maybe a, a little riff or parody on the uh, Spectre Island training sequence in For Russia With Love, where we see all the Spectre agents uh, doing various bits of training and uh, Cleb and Marenzi walk through on their way to Grant down the, the pathway. And then the gag here about poison pen letters was... Again, it's it's another moment where I don't think they intended it, but it wound up being the line was actually used in the Q sequence in Octopussy. So there are actually moments and bits of Casino Royale that have turned up in the official Eon Bond films, and uh, no one's ever acknowledged it, but there's, there's a few little bits here and there. And, of course, Eon obviously did see this film. I don't know if they saw it more than once. They probably couldn't bear it. But, uh, you know, they definitely are well aware of this film, and it has finally come under the auspices of MGM. That was part of the deal uh, to get the 2006 Casino Royale made that uh, Sony wound up handing over their rights to the 1967 film uh, for a certain sum. And in turn, MGM uh, gave them the uh, last little rights they had to the Spider-Man property. So that's how finally the this film wound up under the official MGM banner and has at some points been packaged with the official films uh, only once or twice but uh, that's how it came to be an MGM DVD this happened in the early to mid 2000s Bond gets a, a, a should, yeah Bond because everyone's Bond Tremble gets a Rolex as Bond would have and we have the Dick Tracy sort of G West technology of the video display and, of course, this again also turns up in Octopussy with Q's uh, liquid crystal display on Bond's Seiko. So, I don't know. Maybe, maybe uh, Michael G. Wilson caught uh, this movie on late night uh, television when they were writing Octopussy. Or maybe George MacDonald Frazier did or something. But uh, it seems that it, there was a direct influence on the Q scene in Octopussy here. And this is sort of parodying the uh, you see this in a number of classic Hollywood films the idea that the 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 tailor is very effeminate and uh, the, the whole notion of going in and getting a suit made and and taking your measurements is is very uh, sort of suggestive in, in different ways but what I love is that they overplay all the gadgets and with this nice handheld close-up shot of seller's face you can see how just tremble just doesn't know what's going on. And and everything has a ridiculous contraption in it. And when he simply asks, you know, how do I go pee? They, he can't even say that because they immediately cut it off with the, uh, you know, poison capsule to compartment. So now we're back to 
trying to keep the plot on some semblance of a track with uh, the Sir James in M's office scene. So he's taking the place of M. And if you look at the costuming and everything, this is obviously, they shot this right after the last scene, but we're just now coming back to it because, uh, again, these are just slotted in here and every bit with Sir James and Vesper, uh, particularly once the Scottish sequence is over, every time they're on screen, it's trying to get the film to its next juncture. And it's these little tiny bits. So this is how we get to the character of Mata Bond. And why all of a sudden we cut to supposedly somewhere deep in India or the Far East. And then we get this bizarre but charming shot of Niven complete with white suit and pith helmet on a donkey with an umbrella. And then... We have a black sound stage with these beautiful ornate doors and this music starts to swell because essentially the movie has stopped and we're going into an entire musical number. This is seemingly very much out of a classic musical or almost a Busley Berkeley uh, classic musical number. And right there at the door bowing with bare chest is the iconic Milton Reed who was a stalwart of many classic British films and, of course, appeared a number of times in the official James Bond series, first as a guard in Dr. No, and most notably as Sandor in The Spy Who Loved Me. But here the film has taken a dramatic left turn. We've stopped the plot, and now we're introduced to a complete musical number with this very ornate stage with the beautiful red lighting in the background, this beautiful music that Burt Backrack has come up, uh, come up with and uh, again this is essentially parodying uh you know classic hollywood musicals and uh show-stopping numbers that were literally the film just stops and and we have a musical bit and this just seems like an element of the ridiculous and in some strange sort of way it it, it, it this would be another point where most people would just get totally lost, and I'm not really a, a musicals fan myself, but it's just the right element of the bizarre. It introduces us to the Mata Bond character, and I also like the fact that she's not really supposed to be that great of a dancer. <laughs> so you have all this, these, these intricate uh, bits of choreography going on, and then when she's by herself, she's just kind of like twirling around a little bit here and there. <laughs> And, of course, that, that sort of joke was established earlier with, uh, you know, um, her mother, Mata Hari, being a, a great dancer and a terrible spy. So uh, Mata Bond is supposedly not such a great dancer, but maybe could be a great spy. So this is essentially Sir James making his recruitment trip. And, of course, one wonders, so why is his daughter here and why hasn't he seen her in a long time? Don't ask logical questions, although it is answered to a certain point after the dance number is over. But it's it's randomness, and it's it's the randomness of its placement. It, it, it's, uh, it's got a certain charm to it. I think there's an element of humor in how they just decided, okay, we're just going to stop the movie and have a musical number. And I can't help but think of... Um, Spielberg doing similar things like the opening of Temple of Doom. I, I really do think I, I know he's a massive James Bond fan. I don't know if he's a fan of this film, but the opening of Temple of Doom, I always wondered if there's anything like it where there's just randomly a musical number. And this, this is what I think is, is closest to that sort of anarchic, Hey, we're just going to have a musical number in the middle of the movie. Madabon played by Joanna Pettit, and again, the, the women of Casino Royale, they all are just beautifully photographed and beautifully costumed. They all look stunning, and even though they don't have always a whole lot to do, they, they have such spirit to them. I love how immediately the Madabon character drops the whole charade and immediately kind of affects a sort of English accent when she realizes that this is actually her father, Sir James. And then we get this little backstory about how he just dumped her in an orphanage and still supported her, but then she, like a number of people were doing, sort of followed the lead of the Beatles and went to the East to study with uh, various uh, spiritual guides and things. This is essentially a reference to the Beatles going to India and that becoming sort of an element of pop culture at this time. 
And I like how she's done all this and she's completely unaffected by it. And she, you know, takes a couple puffs on the hookah pipe and, and just, is just kind of doing this because she was bored at the time. <laughs> and then I love how Sir James tosses off, oh no, I'm just trying to give it up right now. <laughs> it's just, th- th- there's little tiny blink and you miss it gags all throughout this film. And even this scene has a number of them. And it alternates between one-liners and of course now it's revealed that they're all worshiping her because she's supposedly the celestial virgin and then sir james looks concerned and then she assures him that no no she's actually very experienced she's just you know leading them on (laughs) and then we get this very uncomfortable but funny moment in the way that niven plays it you know if you want my dad i could fancy you and I think David Niven is probably the only person in the history of the world could, that could carry that that sort of joke and and still remain the ultimate gentleman and deflect it. Uh, so we're also continuing that sort of Bond celibate image here. And then we immediately go into goofball humor. Speaking with Charlie, no. And then immediately go into back into giving some bits of plot out, again using the Sir James character to try and carry this along. And this is getting us into the next section of the film, which will be the German Expressionist sequence when Madaban goes to the spy school in, uh, in, in Berlin. Referencing Matahari again, and then some wonderfully loaded lines about using sexual wiles to charm information. But again, even that set, you just look, all the colors on display, all of the the costumes, this film is never boring. And even a simple scene like this in London City Streets, what is Madaban wearing but a bright pink head, you know, headscarf? She can't just simply be dressed in simple clothes. There's always got to be a bright flash of color somewhere. And then this wonderful gag of, oh, how does she get to Berlin? She just hops in a cab and they drive all the way to Berlin and then they get there and it's smoking because it barely made it. And then in the wide shot, if you look there on the neon sign, uh, one of the nightclubs is the Sexy Blue Angel, which is a reference to the uh, classic film uh, with made by Sternberg with uh, Dietrich. Then this wonderful gag, as soon as you go over the wall, the music changes. It's all red and harsh and dead of life and so dour and depressing. Another gag I really like, she goes off to go on her mission and she just leaves the taxi cab there like she's going to be back in five minutes. I mean, she's back in a little while, but it's like they, they, she's able to do the entire spy mission and then get back to the cab before he leaves. So, of course, in this sequence, we've switched directors again. So now we're on to Ken Hughes, who did this in all, basically the entire Berlin sequence. I also love the fact that the door is actually hidden. It's obscured by the Berlin Wall itself. And she has, Mata has to squeeze in. And then as soon as she gets in, we get into this beautiful set that is a total German expressionist wet dream, if you were. Uh, if you will, um, stark images, alternating shadows built into the walls themselves, these very beautiful, stark portraits, and then this wonderful little music cue, this little bizarre sort of freaky piano riff, and then this light music waltzing in, and then she goes into the dark room and sees the image supposedly of her mother, Mata Hari, and then the lights come on, and the villains of the piece are revealed who are just so completely bizarre that they deserve their own movie. I adore this pair. And then of course, Mata has to take off her trench coat and she of course has on the exact costume is depicted by what her mother is wearing. And I love the gag with this improvised pacemaker. I love the fact that the Frau has a what looks like almost a dueling scar on the side of her face, and she touches it like there's some past history, like Matahari gave her that scar. I'm just reading into this scene because it, 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 none of this is explained. There's so many things going on. Um, and now we go into the spy school within the German Expressionist 
landscape. And I love that they're very diplomatic about they just train everyone. They just want to train great spies. And then, of course, they're naming off various spies and, of course, <laughs> randomly throw off Peter Lorre and Bela Lugosi. And that, uh, the the character we're seeing seems obviously patterned on a Peter Lorre type. So the fact that they even name drop Peter Lorre when it's a Peter Lorre caricature just endears it to me even more. And then how ridiculous some of their scheme sounds uh, have basis in real life with what have actually been you know, revealed with spy uh, operations that went on. And then when they open up to the fighting room, of course, you have all of these uh, girls doing karate and judo, and they're sped up, and, and uh, the footage is sped up, and it's totally ludicrous. They just open the door, and they're just flopping around in herky-jerky motion. It's just totally whimsical. It's a blink and you miss it thing. It's very brief, but I adore it. This sequence is a lot of fun. It, it again, it's another complete left turn. It really, at first, it seems like you've stepped into another movie, and no one buying a ticket to this film in 1967 expected a total satire on German expressionism to just come halfway through the movie. And then we get this really remarkable scene where they go into Matahari's room, which has not been touched since your mother left it, which really has maybe connotations of a psycho. And uh, Mrs. Bates's room inside the house above the Bates Motel, and, you know, with Norman not having touched or disturbed anything since his mother's death. Again, you see Mata Bond here having some gumption, and she starts charming the information out of him. And uh, again, uh, all of the women in this film look so stunning. Even though Joanna Pettit is dressed in this ridiculously jeweled, ornate little costume here, um, it just fits the bizarre surroundings so well. And of course, she's got a feather boa now for no apparent reason other than to further try and seduce her target. But we are starting to get the linkage into the rest of the film. So this this sequence is actually necessary because this is building up Le Chief and why it's important to get to him and why he's trying to raise funds and how he's trying to raise funds. So essentially, this is... Sir James's plan to find out how the chief is trying to cover his own rear end for misusing the state funds and Mata will interrupt the auction and thus cut off his his money flow and so he'll have to then just go back to playing Baccarat and that makes the game the make or break point at, at, that it was in the original novel so it takes a little while when when you get into this sequence you're like wait what is going on but after a couple minutes then we get to the name drop of the chief, and now she's going to get, break into the auction and and uh, start to mix things up. But I like how she just sort of says the chief to herself, and it's like, mm-hmm, and then just proceeds on and acts very Bondian, actually, without knowing exactly what's going on, finds a secret passage, finds her way into the auction, disrupts it, destroys it, and ruins the chief's plans, and then gets out after a nice kerfluffle uh, and fight sequence. Uh, you know, so it, it, this is actually a, a Bondian bit, but instead of Bond, it's the daughter of Bond and Matahari in a house apparently built by, an, uh, by a maniac who's in love with German expressionism. So <laughs> definitely not what you expect, but giving you some of the Bond tropes in an interesting way. And we get the first element of the score in this section doing this um, sort of warbling of, of like, a, like a trumpet when, when you warble it and you use the, um, the cutoff, the adding to the weirdness of this uh, particular part of the score. It really gives it this bizarre atmosphere that goes perfectly with the surroundings. I love the way that, that, that Frau delivers all her lines. Uh, this, this character, Frau Hoffner, is just so nonchalant about everything. And everything seems so completely unreal that it, it definitely is a perfect parody of German Expressionism. 
And this bit of dialogue here where she just turns it back on Mata and then eventually we, the audience, and Mata Bond are left so confused that we completely agree with, you're, in sweet, you're insane, my child. You're quite insane. I think she's right. And then funnily enough, immediately after Frau walks off, she's immediately in the auction house. <laughs> so there's no continuity there because apparently this spy school has a complete screening room. And of course, you'll notice, as all Bond aficionados would, that the auctioneer is played by Vladik Chabal, who is most famous for playing Kronstein and for Russia with Love. He would appear as many Bond actors would in various spy spoofs and things. But of course, Casino Royale is loaded with uh, Bond team members bo on both sides of the camera. You see the uh, head of the Chinese contingent is played by Bert Kwok, who of course was in Goldfinger and Yellow Live Twice and is most famous for playing Cato in the Pink Panther films, along with Peter Sellers. Now this is actually a really funny scene. The, the idea of the auction being that Le Chief has a collection of incriminating and embarrassing uh, photographs that would embarrass the military forces of the world. And so now all of them are bidding, trying to uh, get one leg up on the other or cover up their own incompetence. And then apparently all the, the way they bid is, is trying to suggest how they position themselves on the world stage and the ridiculousness of um, how crazy geopolitics gets at certain points. And of course, our taxi driver just happens to be a legendary British character actor who is also an agent himself because, you know, this, this must be completely wacky in every moment. I love how over the top all of the uh, actors in the auction scene get. And then you have the, the British being supposedly non-committal. And of course, when Mata grabs the, grabs the stills, of course, there happens to be a setting for battle footage. And then everybody automatically assumes, all these military guys assume that there's a battle going on. And in a way, this sort of gives us the requisite explosions that lead into the, the fight scene climax of this sequence. So it's, it's sort of a mini Bond adventure, but completely turned on its head. And of course, how does Mata Bond get rid of the stills? Uh, flushes them down the toilet. <laughs> Now we get the payoff with the makeshift improvised pacemaker by finally pulling the cord. So, of course, this has been set up since we first met this character a few minutes ago. And then they have a little bit of fun with uh, using film speed by, in order to suggest his just complete shutdown process. <laughs> and, of course, it's completely ridiculous, and they dub in the sort of chipmunk-sounding voice. I love Frau's death. It's just just the right element of of the wacky that uh, the, the wackiness that the film can lapse into, and you, you could make the argument that this sort of rambunctious finale to this segment of the film is is set up for how the film will ultimately end, as it does in the casino with the knockdown, drag out battle of everything they could possibly get in front of a camera with this slight wackiness. And you can tell people are kind of having fun. Joanna Pettit is just openly laughing and smiling at getting to hose everyone down with a fire extinguisher. Again, automatically, as a Bond fan, it makes me think of Diamonds Are Forever. But again, there are many times I think the, the Bond official Bond films have sort of inadvertently done things that were already done in this film. <laughs> And of course, the British agent has to have just a Union Jack just like pinned on the back of his jacket to identify himself. And of course, he's going to recognize his superior officer and then get to punch him in the face anyway. And then we get one fourth wall break. When she opens the sewer, we get the classic title song of What's New Pussycat. That's the one nod to Charles K. Feldman in the film. Now we get the payoff of the taxi cab gag. They're going to just drive all the way back to London. 
And then the chief's agent just walks out, fires after after the car. The border guard just stares at him. Doesn't do anything, doesn't react. So the agent goes over into the phone booth and Chief Ball is was was a great actor. So he, he again, he everybody plays this for all it's worth. But now we're finally introduced to the chief, played by Orson Welles, who should have been in an official Bond film, as as should a number of people here. Um, but this sets up the best gag of this sequence, one of the best gags in the film. I and I I do think this may be another Billy Wilder thing because it's so brilliant and so darkly funny. So of course the chief just happens to have a bomb planted in there to kill his hapless associate and it blows a hole in the Berlin wall and we immediately see the refugees come over with the baby carriages because they're just they're waiting for it they come right over before they can patch the hole in the wall so this is the first piece of a a segment that was chopped up to pieces and not really finished this is Trimble playing the character of Bond arriving to go to the Casino Royale and immediately just punches out the guard at the, at the immigration desk. So I have to assume either maybe he just thought he was an enemy agent or um, in the official commentary, John Cork says that he thinks it's maybe just a joke of um, Bond always talking with his fists. Um, I, I think you could read it either way because it's just, again, part of a sequence that we never saw all of. You can see um, he's wearing the same blue shirt on his suit that we see in some of the other um, deleted bits of that same sequence. So now we pick up with bond, with Trimble Bond with Mathis. This is picking up from the little bit in the pissoir we saw at the opening of the film. So if you remember that, now we jump all the way to them uh, laying out more of the plot and then immediately cut back to Sir James because, again, there was so little Peter Sellers footage to work with because he walked out on the production. And that sequence of Trimble arriving in France and setting up uh, that James Bond, in in quotations, has arrived to battle the sheaf, that's one of the most severely trimmed down parts of the film. So we only get that little bit to even establish that Trimble is playing the James Bond part. We immediately cut back to Sir James and now we have Sir James talking with Vesper Lind, again, using these two as our through line characters to try and make sense out of the giant missing chunks that just aren't there. Using the TV watches and then Sir James having one moment of not being quite so celibate by trying to sneak a peek at Vesper. And now we have the young Jackie Bissett as the aptly named Miss Goodthighs, a beautiful parody on the uh, innuendo names of female characters in Bond. Here is where uh, you see Sellers as Trimble trying to have the James Bond affectations, and he's actually really good at it. Unfortunately, when they were shooting this, uh, he tried a practical joke and fired that prop gun at Bissett and terrified her and actually, because it was so close, it actually... um, mess with her eyes a bit from the the actual gunpowder in the blank and totally freaked her out so it's definitely not a an easy first film experience for her but she does look absolutely stunning and of course that's really this this character is just ostensibly here to knock bond out so he can't make it to the casino and do little else but look fetching and just another example of this film having just practically any uh, gorgeous woman that happened to be in London at the time that they could get on onto the set itself. And of course, Trimble is letting his own image poke through because he's had to put his glasses back on first to do the trick shooting. And then he leaves them on, which of course is giving the game away that he is not actually James Bond. And the, the gag this scene is all about is Trimble Bond's drug, uh, drink is drugged by Miss Goodthighs. So he takes an even larger pink pill and puts it in there, supposedly, as he says later, to be a uh, antidote for the, um, for the drug that was put in there. But of course, either it doesn't work or he's so incompetent that he's used the wrong one and just drugged himself twice over. And my favorite part is how Sellers plays it, and the line comes up, my, this is awfully strong shampoo. 
before he collapses in the bathtub. And we hear it off camera and we get this one little shot of Sellers looking passed out, which I think is from when we see Vesper wake him up. And we go into this dream sequence, which you'll see pieces of the cut sequence there. We see Sellers meeting where he would have met Vesper at the airport. He's in the blue shirt again. So that's that's a nut. This is a scene we'll also see pop up with footage in the end credit sequence. But this is just a glimpse of some of the uh, material that just isn't in the film. So it obviously is another seduction sequence between Tremble and Vesper, where apparently Vesper is really going for it, as Ursula Andress looks so stunning. It's such a shame that there's apparently, you know, just miles of footage out there somewhere that may survive or may not. We're also seeing some alternate angles of scenes we've seen before, reusing some scenes or extra bits of footage before uh, the cuts we saw in scenes before. And we get this wonderful image of Tremble playing music as if he's playing uh, Vesper's leg as the keys of a piano. But interestingly, we see the last th- part of the dream sequence is uh, Tremble with Miss Goodthighs to suggest coming back to the present. And we see there the shot of Sellers against the the um, the bathtub is the the same shot they used to start the dream sequence. So they just used the beginning of that. They didn't have uh, or didn't use the footage of him uh, collapsing. So we see Tremble here realizing that the Q gadgets didn't work. Again, uh, acknowledging the ridiculousness of the gadgets of the official films. See Vesper show admonishing him for wearing his glasses. Look at the great line. I, I just like to see what I'm shooting at. And when Vesper says, "I took care of her," I guess there's a deep freezer here for corpses. So you get the shower used as a gag. And again, cold water shower is a classic Bond of the Novels moment. And we get our first real glimpse of the casino set for Casino Royale. And it's very opulent, very just stuffed with people and tables and ornate costumes and bright, bold colors everywhere, right down to the actual casino chips. Honestly, when you look at it, it looks like a much more opulent version of the casino set that we see in, say, Thunderball of the official films. And later, a similar set would appear in Honor Majesty's Secret Service. But this one is, of course, far larger and far more opulent because this is the Casino Royale of the film's title. So here Orson Welles gets to do a bit of his beloved uh, magic act. And apparently this was part of the conditions to get him in to doing the film uh, was that he could do uh, a a bit of his magic act, which he loved doing uh, both on and off stage and on television. It's a nice bit of showmanship. It's another point where the film just sort of stops dead in its tracks, but it does give you a, a moment for the villain to sort of be larger than life. Also, if you look closely at when Orson gets out of the chair there and he stands and sort of, sort of, holds himself stock still and his eyes go really intense. It always makes me think a little bit. There's like a little flash of Charles Foster Kane there uh, when Kane is walking around Xanadu in his old age. Of course, I'm a gigantic, lifelong Wells fanatic and anything worse than ever did, I find just riveting. So <laughs> even when it's just a, a magic act like this, he does it with such charm and he holds your attention and of course, it's ultimately turned into a laugh. So, it it's so quick, it it doesn't it doesn't go on too long, and it's a nice bit of fluff. And they also needed this because, of course, Peter Sellers walked out, and they just didn't have material. And of course, Sellers didn't uh, want to shoot anything with Wells. That's a very well known Hollywood anecdote. I think most people know that, even if they don't know the film. Here at the casino front desk, the attendant is played by Graham Stark, who is a great friend of Sellers and a frequent comic partner. He appears in a number of the Pink Panther films, most notably in the the best of them, A Shot in the Dark, the second film of the series. So, of course, it's it's neat to see him pop up here since he's such a frequent foil for Sellers. 
I got a nice gag here where Tremble not even being used to giving out the name James Bond, and so Bond is immediately recognized. So the the, the clerk immediately asks for his autograph because. <laughs> James Bond is such a great secret agent that he's known the world over. So everywhere he goes, everyone knows he wants a vodka martini shake and not stirred, which has been a, a complaint, a criticism against the official series for a long time, still is. And I like that the film even plays with uh, the criticisms of Bond. So, of course, this is the point at which the film most closely resembles the novel, which is all about the big game where the chief has to win back the money that he's gambled, uh, that he's lost uh, in misusing state funds in order to cover up the theft of the money. And, of course, MI6 knowing that if they can break him at the bank, that he'll have no other option, and Smirsch will eliminate him themselves. So they basically get rid of one of Smirsch's best agents, and Smirsch themselves has to do the dirty work. Are introduced to the wonderfully opulent and ridiculously uh, staged uh, casino manager sets were complete with the stuffed tigers everywhere. And of course the the manager of a French casino is this very dry Englishman <laughs> sort of fitting in with the fact that Mathis himself is not French, but he's supposed to be French. It's impossible to not watch this film and notice all the things that sort of inspired or were lifted or worked into the Austin Powers films. Of course, those films were begun when Mike Myers got the idea when The Look of Love came on the radio one day. Um, But also, there are many little things. Here you have the sort of x-ray glasses where the villain is able to see the cards on the table. Well, that pops up in the first Austin Powers film, just as... um, the dynamic between Evelyn Tremble being sort of clueless and having the glasses and everything and being sort of taken by the hand and led by his much more competent female partner is the setup of the uh, main two characters of the first Austin Powers film. So there's there's a lot of little lifts, and I'm sure Mike Myers is, is as much of a fan of this film as I am because it seems to uh, pop up and be a huge influence on his career, particularly in the Austin Powers films. But this is giving us the plot set up for those who had not read Fleming's novel. And this is where the film is at its most serious and is actually doing Fleming's plot, or at least the main chunk of it. And this is where the original spoof idea would have been. And it would have been much more focused had they just made this the entire film. And the gag being that you had a complete loser schmuck uh, playing James Bond. He's playing a role and he's in over his head, but he kind of lets his his he lets the role take him over a little bit. He gets carried away with the performance, and then still has to win the game. And of course, the the humor continues because, of course, then he's going to be hunted as Bond is in the novel. And we get to a semi recreation of the book's torture sequence when he is captured. Of course, again, the gag being that he is a complete normal dude who is is completely in over his head and you it's nice to see the hesitation that sellers brings in to at least when he gets to the table he, he doesn't even want to announce his name now the bit of the feud that sort of gets reported that happened between sellers and wells it can be really traced down to uh, apparently when um, Princess Margaret visited the set, Sellers talked about it for ages. I'm so excited to see her again. And she came in and immediately went over to Orson, who she was a great fan of. And that sort of uh, didn't put Sellers in the greatest of boots and sort of embarrassed him very much. Uh, and so then after that point, he just didn't want to ever be on camera with Orson, which ironically he fought to get Orson in the film because he thought it'd be a great idea and he was a great admirer of Wells. And of course, later on, they, they managed to become very good friends and sort of put the past behind them. But Sellers was not in the best place in his life at this time. He, he was notoriously difficult to work with. Uh, he was a very complex man and individual and... Perhaps this was not not the best time in his life to be in a picture that wound up being as complex as this. So he wound up essentially walking out on the film 
after well not even before this this whole sequence was completed and instead of bringing him back or waiting or putting everyone on hold eventually charles feldman of all people just decided to pull the plug and fire him and that's where the problems really exploded and when it became a matter of just trying to patch together as much as humanly possible and then on top of that you had the five different directors Two of them were actually involved in this whole sequence because, of course, uh, Joe McGrath, who was a friend of Sellers, who had done television and had just gotten into features, he was brought on to do the Peter Sellers part of the story and essentially the main chunk of the film. But he wound up, Sellers wound up having a falling out with McGrath and really unfairly helped to get McGrath fired off the film. And then the casino scenes were finished by Robert Parrish, which is the majority of his work. So he worked on this. But then also apparently Val Guest wound up doing parts of the casino sequence. So apparently Val Guest wound up working on all five sequences in addition to the extra bits that he had to come up with. Because eventually everyone would have to go off and do other films. So Val Guest worked on John Huston's Scotland portion. He worked on the casino portion. He worked on the end casino portion a little bit. He worked at all the Sir James scenes and all of the Jimmy Bond Woody Allen scenes. And then had to try and work with the editing team and find little bits here and there to try and piece the mess together. And then Sellers randomly going into the sort of Indian voice, I have to think, is a nod towards what he would do uh, the year after this film when he would get back together with Blake Edwards, who he had sort of uh, broken uh, broken ties with. And uh, he created the the, uh, Indian character for the party which has a a similar sort of madcap vibe to Casino Royale and What's New Pussycat. There is actually a good amount of tension here in the scene. Even if you don't know uh, the rules of Baccarat, you can figure it out. And it's actually done pretty well. It's it's very matter-of-fact because, of course, Baccarat is really a game of luck instead of skill. The skill is in maintaining the luck and trying to outwit and out manipulate the other player and the stakes are very high of course since sailors refuse to ever be on camera with wells all they have are cutaways that's why everything is played in close-up and we just have the one or two wide shots like this where they're both in the frame at the same time which was done ostensibly at the beginning of shooting this sequence before uh, sellers put his foot down and refused to be on set at the same time so mostly you had Wells sitting around and everyone standing around, and then they had to just come up with stuff, which is why I'm sure they used the uh, they worked the magic sequence into the beginning. And both play it very well. I mean, it, Wells was such a consummate professional, and you know I think one of the greatest actors we've ever had. And it's a shame that he never played a Bond villain in an official film. And, of course, it's all just like it was a shame that Peter Lorre played Le Chief in the CBS uh, television adaptation. And he would have been outstanding in an official Bond film as well. So here we have the second time Le Chief is played by a living legend at the time extremely well uh, in a non-official Bond production. But I have to say, because it's mostly played out in closer shots and one shots, and then only the beginning and ending, we get the wide shots with both Wells and Sellers in the frame. It does add to the intensity of the scene, and the scene actually works. It is very quick. It's over very fast, as as it would be. But it, it while it doesn't have the intense, drawn-out struggle that we get in the novel, the back and forth over multiple hands. We do get a little degree of Bond almost. uh, He does lose at first as he does in the book. He doesn't completely uh, bust himself uh, as he does in the book. That adds to the drama further, but we do get a little bit of the back and forth where Bond loses at first and then finally raises the stakes as Bond does and would, character-wise, and only then does he break the sheaf at the bank. And now we're getting this setup where Bond and Vesper goes off, and Vesper's going to get kidnapped, just as we get in the novel. But here's one of my favorite gags in the film, where Trimble actually questions why Mathis doesn't have a French accent. And the Mathis just replies, it worries me too. It's another fourth wall breaking gag, and I absolutely adore it. So we get the exterior of the Casino Royale here. It is obviously an optical shot. 
not a super convincing one, <laughs> but still, um, it's all right for the quick moments on screen. Vesper is carried off as she is in the novel, very over the top in an over the top way, simply by having the black bag over her head. But that sets up the gag here, which almost feels a little Pink Panther esque. Because, of course, the doorman accurately describes the beautiful woman in a green dress with a black bag over her head carried off by two rough-looking guys. So Sellers runs off. And then immediately we get this bizarre scene where we have the race car. And if you look very closely, the guy who runs off in a Pink Panther gag that was used in the films, follow that car, the guy runs off. That's actually a champion, a world champion race driver. And here, Sellers is affecting an accent and playing this sort of kooky character who is actually in a lotus at, with James Bond painted on it. So here is Bond in a lotus 10 years before The Spy Who Loved Me and Wet Nelly, The Lotus Esprit. And then he drives off and we immediately cut to he's been captured and it's the torture sequence. So again, that's a another giant moment where it's just like flashing you that okay this is where we just didn't have anything so they that was apparently an outtake or another scene and they had that instead of the car chase that was supposed to follow now of course this is replacing the iconic uh, t- first torture scene of a Fleming novel with Bond in the cane chair where the she viciously torments him for an extended period of time in the cane chair with a carpet beater to his testicles not something you could do in 1967, but if you look closely, there's a nod to it by having Bond in a chair with the center cutout that he falls down into. And there is uh, an instrument on the chair that seems to resemble a carpet beater, but I may be just reading into that a bit much. But I like to think that that's a little nod to the book. I do like that Le Chief would be... Uh, smart enough to do this sort of mental torture and it gives it in the film an excuse to have this very psychedelic crazy wacky we're just going to play with everything and throw a bunch of bright colors at the screen and play with the editing and you see a few glimpses of footage we've already seen and also again little glimpses tiny brief windows into sequences that aren't in the film and you have to keep in mind this is all still in the analog era. They're, you know, cutting probably on a moviola. And, you know, this sequence is actually really creative for what it is. It's just, it, it doesn't explain anything. And since it's a, you know, supposed torture sequence, it's not supposed to make any sense. It's definitely very bizarre the first time you see it. But, you know, the constant cutaways to Sailor's face in different colors uh, almost has a tinge of the um, Stargate sequence in 2001 that would come out, you know, obviously a year later, and all of the cutaways to Dave Bowman's face and his eyes as you see all the colors changing and his face changes colors and he gets more and more frenzied and out of it. So, I, I, again, I know I'm really stretching it, but that's that's the only thing I can th- immediately think of that has a similarity. And I love the suddenly we cut back and, and trembles in in Scottish gear, and we hear the bagpipes again, and then we have the reverse. When he covers his ears, he can hear them. When he takes his hands off, he can't hear them, and then immediately looks at himself. We get the optical with the help coming at the screen, and then immediately he's out there with them suddenly. And since this is supposedly a dream world that's screwing around in the brain of Evelyn Trimble, it's not supposed to make any sense, so... That's why all of a sudden we have a Peter O'Toole cameo. And I think that it's a total improvised bit here where Sellers asks Peter O'Toole if, you know, if he's really himself and O'Toole denies it. (laughs) Now, of course, originally we see Vesper walking in here and how she would be inside the mental torture. I don't know. So maybe this is suggesting that these bagpipe layers are really there since she's about to machine gun all of them down. So it makes this scene even more inexplicable and random. Now, this is a mixture of footage because, of course, she was originally here to rescue Trimble. But here they use a mixture of the footage they had, and they change the order of the shots around, and they have Vesper prove her turncoat status and actually kill Trimble. And this is the way they get Peter Sellers out of the film. And if you look there, that's a complete freeze frame where they just start to put in some smoke over it. 
And now to get rid of the sheaf, we have the agents of Smirsh coming in. And then I love, it's such a stupid gag that they shoot him by coming through the monitor screen of his security camera footage. It's not just the gun, but the actual guy's head comes through. It's a total stupid gag, but I absolutely love it. Again, uh, that's how they got Sellers out of the film. And to be honest, I think it's actually quite brilliant. It's it's a very quick manner of getting him out and not having to worry about him disappearing from the rest of the film. And since they've already sort of established Vesper Lind as a very morally duplicitous character, you don't know what side she's on. You don't know what she's doing other than the fact that she's obviously working for her own particular goals and it just suits her at the moment to be working along with Sir James's plan. So it has basis in what we've seen before and it doesn't feel so jarring uh, other than the fact that we've lost the sort of normal character. And now we go into the sequence of Malaban being kidnapped in the middle of Trafalgar Square. We see a, a, a glimpse of one of the Smurfs agents from the Scotland sequence. And then this bit here with the uh, member of the guard who rides up on horseback and things, this is actually apparently supposed to tie into a commercial that was popular at the time, which is why the extra says, oh, must be a commercial. Now we go into a rather unconvincing optical with the flying saucer that just lands in the middle of Trafalgar Square with uh, Bacharach's Q getting really dramatic. Another not very convincing optical with the uh, guard and horse and Mata coming up to the flying saucer. But it's really just the audaciousness of having a sequence where you have a flying saucer land in the middle of Trafalgar Square in London and then just take off again. It's like, well, why not? You couldn't just have an airplane land. No, you couldn't just have Mata be kidnapped. No, it's got to be a flying saucer. So all of a sudden, there's a scene right out of a 50s sci-fi film in the middle of the film. And immediately, Sir James comes in and knows that she's been kidnapped and knows that it's a flying saucer and knows that the flying jets are tracking it and immediately picks up the phone and it's been lost. It, I, I love the deadpan delivery here and the clip dialogue. That's what makes the scene funny. So apparently now they're lost without any way of tracking her, figuring out where she's been taken to. And of course, it happens to be a nun asking for charity donations, and it just happens to be Deborah Carr's agent Mimi. We get the reprise of the lovelorn strings. Barbara Boucher as Money Penny, also looking stunning as all the women in this film do. So, of course, that's the little bit of information that leads Sir James to Casino Royale and the final act of the film. So here we get more optical and model work. The effects work was handled by the legendary Les Bowie primarily, and it's actually done quite well. A lot of the spy spoofs of this era did have model work and weren't always the most convincing. Uh, like, for example, in, in some of the effects you see in the Flint films, they're good for what they are, but those films had, you know, small budgets for what they were, whereas this film, you know, you could have made five Flint films for the budget of this film and still had money left over. Um, so even, they don't use a whole lot of opticals, but uh, when, when they are there, they are pretty well done, and the little bit of, of model work is pretty well done for the time. But it's also not meant to be absolutely perfect, and it's not meant to be super convincing because this film is not going for that. So I think it was a little bit purposeful to have sort of dodgy-looking effects. Money Penny looking stunning in that dress as well. Again, the costuming in this film, you, you find yourself wanting to just stop and pause and marvel at it. You see so many examples of that, even just on all the extras everywhere. And again... Uh, the casino set is a perfect example of being filled with as many beautiful women, women as they could get uh, at any given time. They went to the casino manager's office, which of course happens to be an, a room that's an elevator that goes down into the bowels. Sir James showing off his fighting prowess and 
this little bit is sort of a matador with <laughs> with, with these uh, guys again coming from the Scottish sequence. So of course they are Smurfs agents, and Sir James is able to get get the drop on them to a certain point. And then at every point from from this moment onward, he is able to wait for the exact moment and get the drop on them to get further into the complex. Then of course gets recaptured again and breaks away again. Because, again, he is seemingly the only person in, in this film that has any semblance of, you know, either having read the script or having intelligence or something. These sets are just incredible. Uh, we hardly see them, but when, when they get into the hallways here with all of the different angles and the alternating colors, they obviously had to build these sets twice over. And then the cutting back and forth and then going into this room with the giant black and white whirl and the colored doors and the revolving walls and the camera just pans around. It at, this is another moment where we go into full psychedelic cinema, which is the term that Valgas talked about. That's what Charles Feldman was shooting for. Basically, if anything didn't make sense, just make it even crazier because that would be more psychedelic. And this was a psychedelic movie because it was the time of psychedelia in the late 1960s so you could think of maybe people dropping acid before they saw this film and people who did see this film I, i'm pretty sure thought that the people who made it dropped acid this image here this set with the two giant matching eye doors on on either side it just it looks incredible and the way that sir james and the evil dr noah are framed in it as they come into the room and, of course, Dr. Noah is seen in shadow as we see the uh, just like the unseen Blofeld of the early Bond films. And we get the robot duplicates in, in shown here. And, of course, the way they are distinguished is that they have the little bit of pale makeup on them. I think they had to have suggested the fembots in Austin Powers as well. And then immediately Sir James is able to steal the Sten gun, get the drop on the villain, shoot the glass out because he's that perfect. And we get the great reveal of the film... That the person behind all of this that has caused Sir James all this craziness, all this stress, the person who dragged him out of retirement, is his very unimpressive nephew, who is so pathetic that he can't even speak in his presence. And then we get Woody Allen being able to do all this wonderful pantomime that just seems so highly strong, and he just, he's, he's so so in the moment and and niven plays off this perfectly even money penny is just taken aback at just the ridiculous of the situation we even get this bit with the invisible glass which you know seems like it obviously wasn't there but if you look at niven's uh fingers you can see he's obviously having to press against something and we see that dr noah jimmy bond is completely inept sort of suggesting what we get eventually with the Dr. Evil character in the Austin Power series as well. So the, the connections are all over the place. And I love that he has a special voice created to sound villainous, and that recording is inside the Bacillus box, and as soon as he opens it, it starts the tape recorder, uh, much like uh, the tape uh, gets delivered to MI6 and Thunderball that's played with uh, Blofeld talking about the stolen atomic bombs. And Dr. Noah is a complete klutz in every, every fashion. Even all, all of the henchwomen here have these beautiful, ornate, metallic-looking costumes, because why not? And now we get the payoff with the glass joke here, with just a foley sound effect. But Alan just plays it. And again, I, I love that he's having to do all this in pantomime. It, it just sells the pathetic <laughs> nature of this character so much. But he still tries to carry himself because he has such a severe form of hero worship that he's still trying to copy his inimitable, absolutely perfect Uncle James. So now Dahlia Lavi re-enters the film as the detainer. We haven't seen her since the training sequence. So apparently if she had any other sequences in the film they're all gone or were never shot. So this is another example of just, you probably forgot about her character entirely. And there's just something so terribly wrong <laughs> about this sequence that it's sort of Dr. Noah trying to charm his, his beautiful, um, the beautiful agent that he's captured 
but uh, he, he she's completely naked and tied down um but that's the only way that he can uh interrogate her or even make her the remote uh p- the remote possibility that she might even at all be interested in him and of course she too like everyone else in the film is obsessed with sir james bond and how perfect he is and in another example about again how all the women in the film do have a sense of spirit and gumption and things she the detainer character is able to you see her try biting back the laughter that she uh, can't help but feel at this pathetic creature she's confronted with uh, this is supposed to be the villain of the film who is of course can't, so incompetent that he can't even show off and but still continues anyway and it's so endearingly charming in, in that sort of way that he tries so damn hard, but is so completely pathetic that he can't even use his own toys in this very odd, designed, like supposedly seemingly modern art influenced set. So even this set has to be completely over the top and wacky. But of course, the detainer is able to actually defeat Dr. Noah and she gets him to swallow his own invention and thus. She is the one who defeats the villain. So interestingly, it's the Bond girl in this section that actually defeats the villain. Uh, Maybe like Domino and Thunderball by the end. But of course, she at this point is also, if you remember, James Bond 007. So James Bond does kill the villain, even though it's the detainer as James Bond who does it. I always love the idea of the, the person as the walking time bomb sort of anticipating uh, how suicide bombers would become more uh, prevalent in fiction in the modern age, I guess. Of course, it's completely ridiculous that it's sort of in like an Alka-Seltzer (laughs) tablet of sorts or an aspirin tablet. Uh, And then you have the tiny time pills with the animated little uh, belches that come up out of Dr. Noah's mouth. And of course, Dr. Noah is a pun on Dr. No uh, and just completely wacky. I love that Dr. Noah is so thick-headed that he can't even see that he's being played so obviously. But he's still, you know, even though he's the evil genius, you know, he still cares. And and then he's still polite enough to turn away while she dresses, even though, you know, he's been staring at her naked, strapped down on a table. He still takes the time to to, to be the nice fool and, and turn around while she dresses and can very obviously purloined the uh, atomic bomb pill. So now we cut back to the prison chamber. We see Monobond and Cooper for the first time in a long time. So he just reappears. And if you ever wonder how they got out, of course, they're capturing the poison gas that's supposed to kill them, which just happens to be explosive. And of course, Sir James knows all this stuff. Get a nice shot of Delia Lobby playing her double. And, of course, all the doubles, you know, if you look very closely, obviously it's a stand-in uh, for the reverse shots. When, But, you know, they actually took the time to try and match the costuming and the hairstyling. Then we have this wonderful over-the-top set. Again, beautifully designed. And for a sort of throwaway gag that most people don't realize, the joke here being that uh, Dr. Noah has built all these duplicates that are supposed to replace world leaders, and he's already replaced certain ones, which is why the uncovered uh, replicas are there. And then it, we get the line, well, that explains a lot. <laughs> and then the overly cultured attendant with the rain cooled tattinger. You can't just have a simple butler. He's got to be over the top as well. And then Woody Allen as Dr. Noah gets to do his villain monologue speech complete with a rising platform with background singers as well. Because it can't just be a simple spoof. It can't just do the the Bond villain monologue and explaining his plot to Bond. No, it's got to have that extra little edge, and I adore it for doing so. I think we get another moment of a, du- a poor dupe having to drink his own drug drink. And Dalia Lavi has such joy in, in basically saying, ah, I've just you I've just stabbed you with your own I've hoisted you on your own petard. We get the first of the animated bubbles and the look of of horror come over Noah's face. 
And his first reaction is to go for Alka-Seltzer. <laughs> if you look here closely, of course, they do speed up the footage a little bit, which has that it has that trademark herky jerkiness to it, which is something you should never do in a film. It looks it looks horrible, but I its usage here is so perfect for the film's whimsical anything goes approach which continues on into how they break out of this facility and just encounter practically anything that uh, just happens to be walking by. So this starts a ticking clock for the climax of the film when the final bomb will go off. Can everyone make it out of the casino, out of the complex, before the bomb goes off? So it's a sort of riff on the classic Bond climax of having to get out of the villain's lair before everything goes sky high. Although, eventually, they just throw that out the window as well. And, of course, there just have to be water jets from both sides that spray out. And it's a beautiful image in that set, which they had to just soak. And then Sir James says, hurry before the fuse burns out. And then literally there's the shot of the giant fuse <laughs> that burns out. And then the door closes. I've always loved this set, too, with the mirrored walls and the curved arched um, uh the curved arches in the ceiling, it seems very Ken Adam inspired, uh, obviously riffing on his designs for Dr. No and You Only Live Twice and such. And of course, in the middle of all this, we have Frankenstein's creature walking around. It's actually Dave Prowse playing him in, in just very simple makeup. And then, of course, Sir James just asks him for the exit door <laughs> and, of course, gets gets the directions he needed. Uh, apparently, Dave Prowse has said that originally he was supposed to play like a giant Winnie the Pooh walking around, but thankfully they they that was apparently too ridiculous for Casino Royale, so they just changed it into Frankenstein's creature walking around. We get this little bit with the sort of bubble cars that then they drive into the manager's office set again. And of course, the controls are hidden inside the tiger's eye and tongue. We get an optical on the one-way mirror to show the passage of the elevator, which obviously is just a set. And then after all that wackiness, and Madaban having an unexplained hairdo change that started in her kidnapping scene, Dalia Dal Dal Lavi runs into the restroom to get out and is never seen again, although uh, she is seen in the end credits, so obviously she gets, gets the boot along with everyone else. So, Chris, this, this would be the moment at which everyone would... You know, seemingly, you would think, just run out of the casino before everything blows up, even though Sir James admits it. But that gets stopped by another of seemingly the bridging scenes where Vesper reveals her true self to Sir James, who seemingly expected it. And this is the, the only bit of payoff we get with Sir James and Vesper Lind. And Coop comes in with the American aid. And this is where the absolute insanity begins of this film's ending, where everything comes into the final brawl, starting with cowboys on horseback literally charging out of a Western, because when we see them, it, it is actually, you know, Western footage. And honestly, that makes me think of Mel Brooks's Blazing Saddles, which came out in 1974, where the film just ends by breaking the fourth wall and turns into a complete brawl where the Western breaks out into the, the soundstage. And again, I don't know if, if this film was a direct influence, but it seems like it was a direct influence on Blazing Saddles for that reason. And from this point on, everything goes out the window and anything they could come up with goes into this brawl, which was shot by a variety of people, uh, and you have most of the principal characters still just roaming around. We have live animals. We have the chimpanzees. We have the the seals on the on the bar stools that are also, of course, uh, they have 007 collars. We have gags where the music is linked to uh, David Niven kicking guys off the casino table. We have the, the spinning roulette wheel that sprays laughing gas. We've got the bubbles going everywhere. This entire beautiful set is being torn apart. There's a dog biting a guy's rear end that, of course, also has a 007 collar. And here's my favorite gag. The guy gets thrown to the, through the mirror over the bar, and it's a room with women being painted gold. Because, of course, why not? And then in another absolutely inexplicable, bizarre moment, more aid arrives with paratrooping Indians all painted 007. We get more cutaways to the Jimmy Bond character counting down to the inevitable doom. And you're starting to think, 
is anyone going to get out of this alive? And no, no, they don't. <laughs> there's, 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 there's nothing but just absolute madness. Again, this is building on uh, the the sort of madcap ending of What's New Pussycat that Feldman had made before this, but this just goes for broke. And now we have the random cameo of George Raft doing his iconic coin flip that made him famous and the, the original 1932 Howard Hawks Scarface. Now Bill Holden comes back, hasn't been seen since the opening of the film, and it's a great shame because he looks like he's having fun doing this little bit part, and it, you know it would be great to see him play off of David Niven more as sort of the Felix Leiter counterpart. Again, I think they would have made a perfect Bond and Felix in a 1950s Bond film. Now John Pell Balmondo wanders in, of all people, and he gets to have this little gag here where he has to translate uh, French into English. If you notice there, he gets to drop, he gets to say merd in a standard release film in 1967. So that's another little bit of charm. I love this gag. When they call for the police, they literally cut to the Keystone Cops. And it's, it's they actually put it in scope format with the rest of the film, complete with a rinky-tinky silent music, piano, cliched sounding music. It, it, it's just no holds barred at this point. And... and what helps this go along is the editing rhythms are, are, are nice and, and kept up. And then interestingly, Raft gets to essentially kill himself with the backwards firing gun and look a bit silly. And it looks like he walks up to David McCallum from Man from Uncle of all people. I love the gag that the fact that Dr. Noah apparently finds some guy with the same glasses prescription he has. is able to get his glasses, get similar glasses back. And then Sir James finds the little contraption to fire bullets at everybody through the Casino Royale. Again, there there is anything they could think of they shoved into this scene. And it just went and went and went and went down to the point where you have this sort of cliched Indian war dance. And then suddenly it just turns into them dancing to the score. It's just... Uh, Words cannot describe this sequence. I just find myself trying to just talk through the images. You, your mind can't process all this stuff. And then finally we get to the last tick, and the model explodes. And then suddenly we're in heaven, and everyone has died. So it's a complete uh, ending that just totally, there. there is no rug left to pull out from under your feet. And then this shot of Sellers is used, uh, t stolen from the uh, torture sequence to show the final fate of Jimmy Bond going down to hell. And then we go into the end titles here with another glimpse of that deleted scene of Sellers and Andres. And we get the end title theme where we get these wonderfully cheesy lyrics delivered in this uh, vocal performance uh, for um, it's the actual theme with lyrics of the uh, instrumental opening title theme. And we see little flashes and freeze frames of moments we've seen and more moments that we haven't seen because, of course, they're using any scrap of footage they have. And I love the sort of affectations that are put on the vocal of this. It's, it's very charming and goofy. And, you know, if you've had to end this madcap experience in some way, you know, it would it would have to be with something completely ridiculous and jaunty like this to send the audience out. Because you still, the first time you see this, you can't possibly uh, process everything you've gone through. And so I think you, you have to take this the way most audiences did in 1967. You have to take it as sort of a jaunty ride. It breaks the fourth wall a little bit. It references all kinds of stuff that were topical at the time and popular. So obviously in, in our modern age, you're not going to get all the references and all the inferences unless you have a background in some of this stuff or you know a lot about the mid to late 60s and pop culture and swinging London and film culture at the time. And there's a lot of bits of history and, and classic film history as well. So if you don't know any of this stuff and you don't know anything about the film, you are going to be extremely perplexed. And I think it's this along with it always being sold as a James Bond film that leads to just the immediate backlash that everyone has for this film. There's, and it, I think it's really a shame that most people go in and just don't understand the madness that's about to ensue. And then we end with a final little flourish and a final 
little blast of trumpet, and that brings Casino Royale to a close. So that ends the film, and again, it, it, it's, it's a madcap ride. It's a time capsule that you have to take you have to take the film as it is. And I think it is most helpful to at least have some general knowledge of the production and how crazy it went, how off the, how even saying the film went off the rails doesn't even begin to describe it. And I'm only scratching the surface here. Um, we have a good amount of detail and there's many anecdotes and bits of trivia and just all kinds of insane stories that are so hard to believe that actually apparently did occur. Um, some are gone over by um, Cork and Ruben in the official commentary. There is a wonderful book uh, called The Making of Casino Royale, which you can get on Amazon that I will link to in the description of this commentary. That is really the best source we have for uh, someone trying to describe the making of this. And also uh, Val Guest did a number of interviews and did some great uh, interview pieces on the official DVDs and Blu-ray that John Cork produced. And just listening to him talk, I, I think, gives the best indication of just how crazy this experience was, how it seemingly went on forever. Uh, my favorite one is how apparently... The film had come out, and then one of the guys went back to the studio, and he finds a guy working on a model, and he says, well, what what, what are you working on? What's that for? I don't recognize this. And he's like, oh, um, it, this is another model for uh, for Casino Royale. And, and the guy's just like, what, what, what are you doing? The, the film's been out for like two weeks. I, I just saw it at the, at the you know, in downtown. What are you doing? And just no one had conveyed the message that they had just, they had, finally finished the dang thing and there was a guy still sitting there in the props department working on a model for casino royale which had already been finished and released so uh, you know that that should explain you know the madness that just that went on and on and on and ironically on an interesting note the film was uh the the sort of point man producer for columbia was jerry bressler who had just come off of the notorious production of uh sam pack and Paws major dundee which was taken over by the studio, and he and Bresler thought, fought like tooth and nails throughout the whole production, which was extremely troubled. And the film was taken away from Peck and Paw and hacked to pieces and released in a very truncated state. Uh, thankfully, it's finally been at least partially restored. It's still extremely compromised, doing a lot of the ideas that would pop up in the Wild Bunch several years earlier. I think it's a masterpiece, but you know, Bresler had gone through that and not been, uh, not really been as probably cooperative as he should have, even though Peckinpah was very notorious for not being the easiest person to work with. But he had gone through that and managed to still save face at Columbia, and the very next thing that he wound up doing was the runaway Casino Royale production that they just had to keep pumping money into because their investment was already so large, the only thing they could do was just pump more money into it. So that essentially, I think, sort of helped to finish off his career at Columbia. So, uh, you know, after him not being so great on Major Dundee, he really goes into Casino Royale, and I, I being a Peck and Paw fan, I can't help but feel like he sort of got his comeuppance a little bit, <laughs> you know, in, in terms of uh, his standing at Columbia being, you know, suddenly the, the person they could deem most responsible for this production that ran away with 12 million of their dollars in 1967. Of course, the film did come out before You Only Live Twice, which did have uh, lower box office receipts than uh, what Eon had expected, and it was uh, it grossed lower than Thunderball had, and really showed that the, the spy craze really had peaked with Thunderball in 1965, and I think... It definitely showed that audiences were starting to get tired of the spy mania that was everywhere because everybody and their brother had some sort of a spy something to try and cash in on the Bond craze. And also, you know, a lot of people thought that Casino Royale had come out and sort of stolen some of Bond's thunder and maybe confused audiences a little bit who went in thinking it was a James Bond film. Even though uh, Broccoli and Salzman, you know, essentially wished Feldman good luck and, you know, go do your thing and, you know, you know hope it goes well for you. Since they couldn't reach a deal uh, to do a official Casino Royale with Sean Connery as an Eon film. So I do think that Casino coming out first definitely did probably have something. I'm sure it probably affected You Only Live Twice as box office uh, to some degree, but I don't think it was anything uh, very large like some people have made out over, uh, and, and over the years. Uh, I do think it was definitely more of the, the whole sort of spy craze having peaked in uh, December 65 with Thunderball. And uh, of course the Bond films would continue to be extremely successful, but uh, the, the mania, the, that, that peak of Bond mania and the spy craze really uh, crested 
with Thunderball in 1965. And so by 67, uh, you, you're already seeing this sort of natural turn of events. And um, But again, it's interesting to note that Casino Royale did, uh, it did come up in the black. It was a success. And I do think that was entirely because of El Guest and getting the film hacked down to something releasable around two hours. And also it had a, a really exceptional marketing campaign with the iconic poster image of the naked tattooed girl uh, with the uh, two silenced pistols and the um, just beautiful, stark, colorful image of, of that as, as the poster. And then having all the stars they could promote, the giant cast list of names they could put on the posters. And uh, again, trying to appeal to a, to a more hip sort of crowd as well as general audiences who were probably understandably mostly confused going in if they went in not knowing uh, what they'd bought a ticket for. So again, there's always been some degree of that, and that's always carried into people going in thinking it's a, a standard Bond film or it's just doing the book, and it's supposed to be somewhat like an Eon Bond film. But what I have to always respect and point out about the film is that it had the courage to completely go its own way, and I think it's all the better for it. I, you know, While I think it, it would have been a, a better experience overall and a stronger film from a standard narrative perspective to have even something resembling a beginning, middle, and end with a, uh, a, a sort of uh, narrative through line that was somewhat akin to the Eon Bond formula and using the Evelyn Tremble character in the guise of James Bond as your, as your sort of figure to follow through the story, which is ostensibly what they started doing, you know, that, that would have resulted in the, the best possible film they could um, work from from a spoof perspective. Uh, and obviously parodying the James Bond films. But I think everybody got carried away, and I think Charles Feldman got carried away with the notion of psychedelic cinema and all these great ideas, and then being influenced by all these anthology films, and then being able to pack it full and make it the most star-studded extravaganza that anybody had ever done, and being you know, the top agent in Hollywood and having practically everybody who was even living or breathing's phone number in his Rolodex, uh, that obviously I, I think would, would be an idea he would come up with. And again, I don't think any of these were really bad ideas, but trying to do all of them at the same time and not really having a game plan and your producer being someone who is not an experienced film producer and really is coming from the background of being uh, a talent agent not the strongest foundation to work from and then you have the five different directors and the different bits of crew and the production that seemingly never ended and then everything gets compounded by Peter Sellers walking off the set and then Feldman eventually just deciding to cut all ties and fire him and that just completely for lack of a better term it foobarred everything there there was no come there was no turning back after that point and again, the more I study it, the more I look at it, I have to once again credit Val Guest for being the one person to, who was able to somehow salvage any of this material. And once you become accustomed to Casino Royale 67, it, it becomes a sort of old friend in a way. I, I, it, I find it so charming. I absolutely adore this film. It breaks every convention of being a good picture. It may very well be the greatest bad movie ever made. Uh, that's, a, that's something, uh, a title that gets thrown around a, a lot these days, and people really enjoy watching movies that are terrible, and now there are films made that are ostensibly made to specifically be bad, and that's the joke. But here you have a picture that is so overflowing with talent and interesting things and 500 things going on at any given time and all kinds of references of different eras and uh, a film that is really a time capsule of not just 1967 and psychedelia and pop art and swinging London, but also a time capsule of old Hollywood and the way that films used to be made with opulence and grandeur. Uh, so it, it really is... It's a time capsule for many different things, and it's trying to appeal to, like, gosh, so many different types of audiences because you have all the references to historical events and figures. You have the references to 60s color, uh, culture. You have the references to even television commercials at the time. There is no rhyme or reason 
or any sort of guiding factor to what the film is going to spoof next. The only thing that it comes back to is spies and the spy craze and James Bond. And so, of course, everyone in the film is James Bond 007, because that is the type of logic we're operating on here. Logic that is not any semblance of logic. And it's that madcap insanity, that this sort of energy that permeates the film that, that, that has such an eagerness to please. It just wants to entertain you. It wants to give you a good time. And even if there's sequences that don't work for you or there's, there's uh, references that you don't necessarily get, even those, I think, start to become more charming the more times you rewatch it. And again, to return to what I talked about at the start of this track, this is a film where you really have to get on its wavelength. If you can do that, if you can manage to get yourself on the same crazy wavelength, if there was a if there was an audience dial, as if you're dialing in a radio station to get on the same frequency uh, as as the broadcast, if you can do that, you'll love the film to pieces. And nowadays, I I do truly consider this film a masterpiece. It's indescribable. It's unbelievable. It's absolutely illogical. But damn, is it fun. It is truly endearing. And I absolutely adore it and will forever adore it. I watch this film every year now after I watch, I rewatch the official Bond films, I rewatch the original 20, and then I immediately rewatch the 1967 Charles K. Feldman spoof film Casino Royale. And this is me, the diehard James Bond fan, the dyed in the wool, Fleming purist who enjoys and prefers the Terrence Young more serious style the official film started out as, but also enjoys the whimsical, more higher living, lighter edged Guy Hamilton style that started to creep in. And also I adore the highly witty and sort of self-satirizing Tom Mankiewicz style that came up in what I call the Tom Mankiewicz trilogy of Bond films. So in a lot of ways, I think you get some of all of that in Casino Royale. And the many Bond references are, I think, peppered all throughout the film uh, for Bond fans to spot. And that's another thing that I think makes this film really applicable to Bond fans in particular if you can come to it with all this understanding, or at least some bit of it, if you understand what you're getting into and you're a Bond fan, I think you'll be, I think you're quite surprised uh, at all of the the little flourishes, the little flourishes of Bond. And again, as I said before, they're, they're never demeaning. They're not making fun of Bond. They're making fun of Bond-isms. They're making fun of uh, things that are almost becoming cliches of Bond. And they're, they're twisting things on their head, and they're playing with them a bit. You get the giant, over-the-top, beautifully designed, giant set villain lair, like a Ken Adams set. You get the film's version of that. You get the film's version of the Bond versus villain in the casino. You get the film's version many times over of all the beautiful Bond women. You get the film's twisted view on types of the Bond character and elements of the Bond character as reflected in the Evelyn Trimble Bond and the Sir James Bond. And, of course, for the little bit that he's in the film, the Cooper Bond as well. So it, it, it's a film that never fails to get stale. I always find new stuff in it. Uh, it. It did take me a while to get into. I will admit that it is not the easiest film for people to sit through. And most people will have a knee-jerk reaction because they don't know just the insanity of the film's production and how it's even a miracle we have anything that has uh, that was even releasable and edited down into something around two hours that Columbia could throw out as a Hail Mary pass to try and get their $12 billion back, which, again, amazingly, they did. Um, this film was pretty decently received in 1967. You know, most critics would either tear it apart or just treat it as the sort of farce that it is. And there were so many farcical films in the 60s that are just they just don't work outside of their release and many that didn't even work then a lot of those anthology films were are are actually really quite stale and that's the thing although i do think the scottish sequence does drag a little bit um and it goes on for for far too long probably um casino royale never gets stale and it mixes uh highbrow and lowbrow humor with just absolute aplomb there is no um 
it switches between the two so effortlessly that most of the jokes you will not get the first time you see it. You will have to see it multiple times, and then you find yourself quoting the picture. I, I mean, I quote this film all the time. I get pieces of the score stuck in my head. And once again, the score. Oh, my goodness. Uh, if you've ever seen this film and haven't fallen in love with the Burt Bacharach score, it is absolutely one of the great film scores and again i have to say the recording of it is just majestic the mono mix of the film does not do it justice it is revered in audiophile circles for great reason uh if you haven't owned a copy before please do yourself a favor try and find the original cold gym stereo lp it's very tricky to do uh, but i can't recommend it highly enough and definitely go get the quartet anniversary reissue cd that chris malone produced it is one of the finest sounding uh, score reissues uh, one of the best score reissue releases i think anyone has ever done it's absolutely incredible how much they were able to use from that safety master so I could continue babbling on and on and on about this film. I have just barely scratched the surface. There are so many anecdotes, so many urban legends about the film's production, and I could have spent three hours simply trying to piece together the internal logic of the film. And to be quite honest, I, I've, I've thought about it very often, and if you really look at it closely... I know a lot of people talk about the plot inconsistencies and the missing footage and the jump cuts and things like that. But if you look at it and you, you really scrutinize how the, the final edit is and getting it at 131 minutes, it does actually have a sort of internal logic. And that all goes back again to Val Guest focusing on and writing and directing and developing the scenes with David Niven and Ursula Andress and using the Sir James Bond and uh, Vesper Lynn characters as an improvised through line. And that's why their scenes are peppered throughout in these little tiny bursts. And we will we'll have a big chunk of what the heck is going on. And then we'll immediately cut back to them and we'll get this tiny little bit. And we'll get, it's it, obviously, it's got a lot of plot exposition. It's very exposition heavy. And then we immediately go on to the next uh, train and we're going on, on this destination. And then we get another little bit of Vesper or Sir James or both of them. And then we jump onto the next train and we're going to somewhere completely different. So if you look at it closely, you can follow this very, very, very faint narrative through line. So there is just the faintest thread of narrative cohesion. And I know uh, from everything that you can find out about the film and all that Val Guest would, would say in the interviews uh, and in his own um, autobiography, you know, I know that he and the editors were just standing there tearing their hair out. And all Charlie Feldman could do is, you know, be like, ah, as Val Guest said, you know, can't you take the belly laugh out of real two and, and put it in real four? Because there's not enough belly laughs in real four. And it's like, you can't make movies. That's not how it works. So again, that's another sign. You were dealing with someone who was producing this film who was just not experienced as a film producer. And when that's the person holding the reins with five credited directors and everybody who they possibly could get who wasn't shooting something else and everything is in front of the camera that wasn't nailed down, that should give you a pretty clear explanation of how and why this film went so completely and totally off any sort of rails that it might have started on. And you know what? Gosh darn it. Thank goodness that this happened. Because this film is just so charming and endearing. And again, it becomes like an old, very bizarre, very quirky friend that you revisit and spend 131 minutes with every once in a while and have a few laughs, some head scratching, and you wind up just throwing your hands up and laughing at the insanity of it all, and you go along for the ride, much like Jaws and the Rio Carnival in the official Moonraker. That is, once again, if you can manage to get on the wavelength of Casino Royale, and as the original advertisements and trailers and promotional materials indicated, if you can join the Casino Royale fun movement. So that's my commentary track for 1967's Casino Royale, a film I have come to absolutely adore for, in spite of and actually because of its absolute madness. I do think this film is a masterpiece, and there is not anything in the world before or since that has ever been like it. It is a true original. 
And in spite of the many hardships and the absolute insanity of the film's production, uh, once again, I think entirely due to Val Guest having to pick up all the pieces, it, is, it manages to come together into a 131-minute wild, wacky ride that eventually ends up in heaven and hell itself. It's a time capsule of more than one bygone era, and I think it's about darn time that this film be taken more seriously and properly examined, because even if you hate it or you don't like it at all, or you just don't get it or you don't want anything to do with it, it is absolutely fascinating to study, and it's so rewarding to study because you learn so much about not just the film and James Bond and Spy Mania in the 60s, but how films were made in the 60s and how something could go so completely wrong. And you learn lessons about filmmaking in general that you might want to apply if you ever do go into the world of filmmaking yourself. Again, it breaks every rule in the rule book. It is a bad movie in every respect except for the fact that I think this may be the one true film where the phrase, it's so bad that it's good, really starts to come to the fore because all the elements inside the film are great. They're just all thrown, jumbled together on top of one another, and every darn thing is compromised further by the fact that the film's ostensible star was, you know, walked off the set and then was eventually fired. And then they just had to figure out what the heck to do and already had multiple directors and, and were essentially doing an anthology film inside of a spoof film inside of a take on James Bond. So if you've made it through my babbling to this point, I want to thank you ever so much. Uh, this is a film that's very tough to discuss, and I'm actually very happy that I, I have encountered some people who do love this film as much as I do. It's a very rare thing to, to encounter other fans of Casino Royale 67. But uh, we, we, we are out there in, 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 in various parts of Bond fandom and even non-James Bond fans. I've encountered some who, who actually do uh, profess a, a, a liking or love of this film. But I do think it's a film that deserves to be properly analyzed because it's just forever fascinating. It's a film that never gives up all of its secrets because there's just so much to process. And there's so much footage that we've just never seen. Uh, I think it would be fascinating if any of it is ever rediscovered. Um, I would I would absolutely kill to see any of it or any script materials or continuity bits that might exist for prior versions of the film. And of course, the original Ben Hecht screenplay elements that have leaked online are absolutely fascinating because he wrote a beautiful, serious adaptation of Fleming's original novel, which is still an underrated great novel as Fleming was really a literary genius and never... Uh, given the credit he was due as as a great writer. Again, this is not a definitive history of the film. I am just scratching the surface, and even now there's still so much that I didn't even begin to get to cover as doing these tracks. It's very difficult to try and keep up with the film and do a running commentary, and I'm just doing the best as I can uh, going in and just completely... Uh, starting from scratch without any notes or anything. Um, Just trying to give you an idea of all the things that go through my head every time I revisit the film, which I now watch yearly. And it is a film that I think rewards repeat viewings, perhaps more than any other film, simply because you're able to process all the insanity that your that your brain is 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 going through because you cannot it is impossible to do it that first time it requires two three four five viewings at least um which i know will be an even harder sell for people who hated it the first time so um if this convinced you i I really i would really be um amazed and very happy to note uh if anyone maybe uh comes around on the film or maybe has a is able to I hope you're able to have a different look at it I hope I've been able to sort of get past the usual barrage of negativity that surrounds Casino 67 and and maybe get closer to the actual merits of the film of which I think there really are many but it's usually something that most diehard Bond fans just avoid or don't even get into or or, or fail to look past the uh, just the tomfoolery that's going on and the insanity of the supposed narrative not making any sense and there not being any narrative cohesion which again i i completely understand but it is one of those films i do really think you have to have some sort of knowledge of what it is going in because without that you are going to be completely lost and if you do find yourself completely lost if you can get on the film's wavelength you can indeed join the casino royale fun movement So with that, again, thank you ever so much for listening. And as always, I'm very humbly yours, the motion picture analyst.